Welcome, welcome to everybody. Please take a seat. <clears throat> I would like to start the OTB Electronica Day. <clears throat> Two words quickly. I'm really proud to, to announce that uh, now we are here. There are more than 58 research centers coming from 22 different nations. I hope that you enjoy the day. So I invite Francois Hug as a first speaker and um, coming from University of Côte d'Azur. Hi everyone, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my work. Um, so today I'm going to present a novel neural framework to assess movement control at the spinal motor neural level. So as you all know, understanding how movement is produced, is controlled, remains one of the main challenges in many scientific fields. For example, we don't know much about how these skilled movements are produced or even how simple movements such as grasping an object uh, are produced. So there is a long-lasting hypothesis that movements are controlled through a combination of muscle synergies, where a synergy is defined as a group of muscles receiving the same command. So on the right-hand side, you have an example of four synergies controlling lower limb muscles during gait. So for example, the first synergy in blue is mainly composed by muscle one, three, and four, and receives this activation, uh, this activation. The second synergy in red is mainly composed by muscle five and six and receives this command, etc. And so these synergies have been proposed as building blocks that could simplify the construction of motor behaviors. Indeed, by sending the same command to uh, multiple muscles, it does reduce uh, the number of degrees of freedom to be controlled. But is there really a dimensionality problem at the muscle level? So in other words, are we looking at the good scale? And indeed, we know from a long time that motor neurons are the final common path for motor control. So it means that the central nervous system likely controls hundreds or thousands of motor units instead of dozens of muscles. So it's the reason why we recently proposed a novel framework which is based on the assumption that uh, movement is produced at the motor neural level. So this framework has four main assumptions. The first one is that motor neurons are grouped into functional groups or clusters or synergies based on common inputs they receive. So it's what you can see on this figure where you have motor neurons innervating three different muscles and you can see that these motor neurons are grouped into three different clusters. But what is the most important is that these clusters may significantly differ from the classical definition of motor neuron pools such that they may involve only a portion of a muscle or span across muscles. So again, it's what you can see on this figure where you have motor neurons innervating muscle one which are split into two different clusters. And in contrast, you have motor neurons innervating two different muscles, so muscle one and two, which belong to the same cluster. So it's perhaps the uh, most important assumption of this uh, framework. So the third one is that clusters represent functional modules used by the central nervous system to reduce the dimensionality of the control. And the fourth assumption is that selective volitional control of single motor neurons within a cluster receiving common inputs cannot be achieved. So what I mean here is that we predict that we shouldn't be able to dissociate the activity of these two motor neurons be because they belong to the same cluster, in this case, cluster one. In contrast, we should be able to dissociate the activity of these two motor neurons even if they uh, both innervate the same muscle, because they belong to do two different clusters. So what do we need to uh, prove or disprove this framework? So first, I think we need to decode the activity of a large sample of motor units. And so you have here a study which has been published last week uh, from the Dios group. And uh, what they showed is that we can optimize the design of the grids of surface electrodes to uh, identify much more motor units. For example, by increasing the density uh, of the electrodes. In this study, we uh, used a combination of four grids of 64 electrodes on the vastus lateralis and tibialis anterior. 
And using this configuration of four grids of 64 electrodes, we were able to, to identify up to 100 motor units for the tibialis anterior and up to 75 motor units for the vastus lateralis. So actually, on these figures, you have on the y-axis the number of motor units, on the x-axis the contraction level from 10 to 80 percent. And you can see that even at 80 percent of MVC, on average, we were able to identify uh, 30 motor units and 25 for the vastus lateralis. We also need to uh, optimize the EMG decomposition, and part of this optimization will come from sharing uh, codes, sharing algorithms. And so you have here an example of an open source software which has been uh, developed by Simon Avrion, who is a postdoc in the Darius lab. And with this software, you can first decompose the EMG signals, and you can also edit the results of this decomposition. And as you can see, there are plenty of options that you can play with to optimize the decomposition. So I'm not going to present this, uh, this software because Simon and Dario will uh, present it during a tutorial organized by Hasek, Isaac and Jack on early December. So we still need to, uh, to, to, uh, to fix the date, but it should be early December. And so in the meantime, if you are interested, you can download the software and test it so you can find the link on the preprint. We also need to decompose uh, EMG in real time. So it's very useful, for example, to test hypotheses re related to the flexibility of motor unit recruitment. We also developed an open source uh, software uh, that you can download, uh, which is able to decompose EMG uh, in real time. So it has been developed by Simon and Julien Rosato, who is uh, one of my former PhD students. So here is an example of a study that you can run with this uh, real-time capability. So in this study, which there are preliminary results, so we are still uh, processing some data. But in this study, we ask the participants to independently control uh, motor units, two motor units. Uh, so actually, they had to move a cursor on a 2D space, and the position of the cursor was driven by the discharge rate of the two motor units. So in the first experiment, we provided to the participants uh, the activity of a motor unit from the gastrocnemius medialis and the activity of a gastrocnemius gastro gastro lateralis muscle. So two motor units, one from the GM, one from the GL. So what you have in gray is the discharge rate of these motor units during the reference contractions. So during these contractions, there was no feedback on the discharge rate of the motor units. The only feedback which was provided to the participants was a torque feedback. So they had to maintain the torque constant. So first, we asked the participants to move the cursor in this region. And you can see here that there is a thick line, which is actually the discharge rate of these motor units. And you can see that actually the participant was able to activate the GL motor unit without activating the GM motor unit. Then we asked them to uh, move the cursor in this region, and again, they were able to uh, isolate the activity of one motor unit, in this case, the GM motor unit. So there is an activation of the GM without any activation of the GL motor unit. So it's a good example of flexibility that you kind of expect on this, uh, on this uh, muscle group. In the second experiment, we uh, provided uh, a feedback of a motor unit from the vastus medialis and a motor unit from the vastus lateralis muscle. And so when we asked the participant to move the cursor in this region, uh, the participant was able to activate the VL motor unit without activating the VM motor unit. But when we asked them to move the cursor in this region, the participant wasn't able to uh, isolate the activity of the VM motor unit. And we observed similar results when we provided the feedback of two motor units from the same muscle. So in this case, the gastrocnemius medialis muscle. So in these two examples, it looks like there is a kind of flexibility, but we believe that it's not true flexibility. Actually, the participant managed to um, uh, isolate the activity of the lowest threshold motor unit. And because they had to maintain the torque constant, they compensated, so in this condition, with the rectus femoris, and in this one, with the gastrocnemius lateralis. 
So in this study, we asked the participants to produce an isometric multi-joint task. Uh, so the pedal was fixed and they had to match a force vector. So we measured the activity of six lower limb muscles and we decoded the activity into motor unit spike trains. Then we calculated the correlation for each pair of motor units and from this correlation matrix, we constructed force directed graphs. On this graph, each node is a motor unit, a motor neuron. And so the motor units which are correlated tend to attract each other. So they are positioned close to each other. And the motor units which are not correlated tend to uh, be positioned further apart. And then we apply the clustering approach to identify functional clusters of uh, motor units. So you have here the results, one of the results. So you have three individual examples. On the left hand side, the color indicates the muscle, which is innervated by the motor neuron. And on the right hand side, the color indicates uh, the cluster. And so we, obs we observe results which are compatible with the framework that I've just presented to you. So first, motor neurons innervating the same muscle do not necessarily belong to the same cluster. So for example, here in dark red, you have motor neurons from the biceps femoris, and you can see that they are split into two different clusters. Conversely, some motor neurons from different muscles, including distant muscles, belong to the same cluster. So you have here an example from, so you have a vastus lateralis and vastus medialis, and you can see that all of these motor neurons are grouped into the same functional cluster. But perhaps more interestingly, uh, you have here motor neurons from the biceps femoris in dark red, and in orange, you have motor neurons from the gastrocnemius medialis, so distant muscles, and you can see that they are grouped into the same functional cluster. So thank you. I would like to uh, thank my collaborators. So, um, so Simon and uh, Dario are key uh, in all of these works. And if you are interested by the research topic or by the nice weather in, uh, in Nice, which is not so far from uh, Torino, uh, I have a, a one-year postdoc position which will be opened uh, very soon. So thank you. Thank you, Francois, for uh, your presentation. Um, so, well, first of all, welcome to Turin. Welcome to the OTB Electronica Day. We are really happy uh, that you came. Someone of you really comes from far. So, thank you, thank you. Yeah. One more official uh, communication. It's about uh, our new logo. Uh, so, we have updated it a little bit. And also, we, have, we, are, we would like to present a new device that is well, we still have to do something on this guy, uh, but it's, uh, it will be ready hopefully soon. It's a DEX device. It will take the place of our Quattrocento. The name is Novecento. That means 900, and there is also a plus. So it's more than 900 channels. It's a little bit different. The concept, you have uh, 10 inputs where you can connect uh, uh, all the props that you want. And uh, we introduced also a new prop with 96 uh, uh, channel, so new kind of grid with 96 electrodes. Please, if you want to, Usha, if you, it's, it's your time for presenting, yes? So Usha is coming from uh, the New, new Brunswick, uh, University of New Brunswick in Canada, and uh, she talked about uh, the movement and analysis combined with uh, high density MG. Please welcome Usha, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. I wanted to share a little bit about what our lab does at the University of New Brunswick. Um, it's the Andrew and Marjorie McCain Human Performance Laboratory, and we are located in the Faculty of Kinesiology. Um, primarily, our research is in the area of kinesiology, biomedical engineering. Um, my work is in neuromuscular physiology and surface EMG applications, and we also do some work in human factors engineering and ergonomics. The lab was created in 2011, and we had an idea of building a lab on a jogging track in a newly constructed building, which sounded like a really good idea, but there was lots of challenges as we developed the lab. Um, but the nice thing with it is that it sits in the middle of a 190 meter jogging track with double doors on either side. So you can open up the doors and it allows you to look at human movement with people walking, running, or even wheeling through the lab. 
Our lab is equipped with, equipped with 12 uh, T160 Vicon motion capture cameras, six force plates, an isokinetic dynamometer, which we had a very old system, but two weeks ago we just got a new one, so that's been installed. We have a high density EMG system and several other EMG systems and pressure pads. What we decided, I guess, just over 10 years ago was that it was critical to bring all that infrastructure together. The co-director of the lab is a clinical biomechanist, so she is involved heavily with motion capture and looking at different kinematics and kinetics of gait. Um, my area is more EMG looking at muscle activity. So I just wanted to share a little bit of the research that we do, primarily in kind of the basic human movement research, some of the applied research we do, and the clinical work. So this is some early work that we did looking at lower limb function using a high density EMG system. This is Santa Quattro. We looked at one muscle and looked at quadricep function during knee extension. And we varied the speed, the varied intensity. But more importantly, we looked at sex and age differences. We did find some, but obviously one of the limitations was that we looked at one muscle, the quadriceps. Quadriceps has four muscles to it. So we increased the number of muscles and we continue to see differences. But it also told us that we really wanted to improve our protocols and think about how we were gathering that data to ensure that we were looking at the muscle as a whole. Currently, I have a student that's looking at the tricep surrey muscles during plantar flexion. Um, he's a former runner, so he started by doing some honors work looking at university runners compared to um, uh, controls. So what he is doing is looking at the medial and lateral gastroanemius muscles using 232 channel grids, as well as the medial and lateral soleus muscle. Soleus is a little bit understudied and continues to be. So he, want us, he wants to look and see what are the differences um, across different levels of contraction, both in men and women. He's using a ramped isometric protocol. We have not really delved into decomposition, but thanks to significant work from several people in this room, as well as OT Bioelectronica, this is something that is more accessible to us now through the software, as well as the established protocols. So he is going to be investigating decomposition to see what the differences are throughout the varying intensity. So that's a few of the projects that we're working on that are more our basic kinesiological studies. We also do human factors and ergonomic research. We have a number of industries in New Brunswick that we work with, and four consistent items come up as concerns for, for workplaces. Repetitive work, obviously, and the strain that that can put on the muscles, uh, musculoskeletal disorders, fatigue, and we also work with our local uh, workers' compensation board to help with rehabilitation and return to work programs. It's not sufficient to say somebody has an injury without trying to determine how to get them back to to work. So a couple of the industries that we work with, we live in eastern Canada, so we have a lot of forest operations. So a lot of work we've done has been instrumenting the cab of forest harvesting machines, the machines that fell the trees and then load them. Um, we've done some work with store clerks and that are standing in one position for a long period of time. And then the far left is just my shout out to my hometown that um, we live near a symbol manufacturing factory. So the company that makes symbols for musicians. Um, and they worked with us on a project because a lot of their workers have injuries because they continue to do hand hammering and there's a lot of vibration as they build these symbols. Recently, one of my graduate students looked at platform carts and pushing tasks. And um, she was looking at a standard industrial platform cart. We weighted it with about 200 kilograms of weight to mimic something that's typical in lots of work operations. And she looked at the external obliques, the rectus abdominis, and the rectus spinae. Because of the limitation with how many channels we had, she did have to do three trials um, and move the electrodes. But basically what she was looking at is what was the impact of changing the handle height of the cart as well as the handle orientation. And with all of the work that she did, she found that pushing at hip height with a horizontal handle design resulted in lower muscle activity, which would suggest that that's what you want for an industrial task, particularly as people are working for long periods of time. So that's some of the um, ergonomics and human factors work that we do. A bulk of my research in the last 10 years or so has been looking at upper limb prosthesis users. This is some very early work that we did using a high density EMG system. This is not an OT bioelectronica system. This was a, shall not be named, <laughs> another competitor system. And it's amazing the, um, 
advances that the company has made in terms of grids. We had to gel each one of those electrodes individually. It was a bit of an experimental protocol nightmare, but we did get um, data from prosthesis users, from individuals amputated limb. And what we were looking at was to whether or not they could actually produce these um, common wrist and hand movements that are used in prosthetic control and whether or not we could see distinct and repeatable patterns. And we did, and the classification accuracy for the uh, pattern classifier, as we moved to a subset of movements, the prosthesis users, so we had two uh, congenital um, amputation individuals and then two individuals with trans um, traumatic amputation and the classification accuracy did come up. This was very early work and certainly things became a lot easier as we went to more robust systems, ones that were easier to place. Um, so we continue to look at myoelectric control using EMG. Robustness is always a concern in clinical settings. Increasing functionality. It's funny, we, we had a um, we had a, a meeting a couple years ago, a myoelectric control symposium, and we had an individual with four amputations, and he discussed the importance of not getting too excited because we have a 95% classification accuracy, because if you're the individual that has that cup of coffee and it drops, 95% is still not good enough. So I had a student that was looking at different kinds of um, classification systems, and this is probably OT by Electronica's legacy system now. This is the trend to do, and what we did is we used electrodes around the forearm, oops, oops, to um, collect data from able-bodied as well as prosthesis users. I don't know if this will work or not. You can see it a little bit. Um, so what he did is he looked at two control schemes, a linear regression with frequency division technique and then a standard band pass processing, and he did find the LR, um, shoot, sorry, did find that the frequency division technique did perform quite well. We also have looked at transtibial amputation um, using isokinetic dynamometry, and we were hoping that the HDEMG data could give us greater insight into muscle activation. Um, the availability of the dynamometer is great because it allows you to do dynamic contractions in somewhat of a controlled fashion because you can control the speed. But we wanted to see whether or not this is something that we could pursue to use for strength training. It resulted us in us creating um, an adapter for the leg because every, every clinical participant is different, their amputation looks different, and how they attach to the unit was challenging. Um, and we did find some success with this, looking at different patterns. We looked at the rectus femoris from affected and unaffected sides. I work with a clinical um, research occupational therapist, and an area that she's really interested in is the dominant versus non-dominant side. When you have a traumatic amputation, the amputated side automatically is classified as the non-dominated side, even if it wasn't prior to the injury. So this is something that she wanted to look at to see what is the impact. So we found that the prosthesis users did demonstrate strength and muscle activity differences between their non-affected and their affected side, which is not surprising. Um, but more importantly, we found that we could use the dynamometer successfully with these patients. And what we are currently looking at is a strength training program using the dynamometer to see what are the muscle activation differences that occur post-training. And maybe this is something that could be helpful for that population. Very recently, we've been looking at individuals with transradial amputation um, and trying to move to functional tasks. The dynamometer is great, but again, once you are doing a task that's unconstrained, everything becomes much more complicated, as I'm sure everybody here is well aware of. Um, this individual here actually has quite a bit of residual limbs, so getting her into the unit was um, fa fairly straightforward. So we had her using the isokinetic dynamometer. You can see on the affected side there's definitely a limitation in the range of motion, and that's because of the prosthetic limb. And then we also wanted to move, and this is something that we're currently looking at, um, is functional tasks. We had the patient lift a box from the counter to a shelf. We had them push and pull a door, and it, we're, we're struggling a little bit, and certainly if anybody has any suggestions, I'm happy to hear them, about how to deal with those unconstrained mo movements. 
The research that we're currently working on, um, one is interpretability. Again, I work with a number of clinicians, so it's wonderful that we can get this data, but we're looking at better methods to try to give them data that is easily understandable in a timely fashion. So when a patient comes in for their prosthetic fitting, they may be in the clinic for a day, they may be there for half a day, but how can we use this technology so that we are giving the therapist information in a timely fashion? Maybe it's through the use of development of apps or something like that. Um, we need to increase our clinical participants. I've been collecting data from prosthesis users for over 10 years, and we still don't have a cohesive pool of subjects to run statistics on, so we tend to present data as case studies. Um, we have an upper limb clinic in New Brunswick that's attached to the university, which is very convenient, but the challenge again is that every single clinical user has a slightly different amputation, even if it's congenital, transradial, transtibial. We continue to look at different methodologies. The features that we look at with the high density signal tend to be those that are already established in the literature. Again, many of you have already established these. Um, but we want to look further into things like machine learning algorithms, um, looking at muscles moving simultaneously. We're currently doing some work looking at co-contraction. So certainly the presentation this morning talking about muscle synergies is very interesting. So trying to expand upon that. And then finally, we are working on e-textiles. Um, there's all kinds of wearable sensors that are embedded into clothing, into different kinds of material. We've had difficulty finding a high-density EMG system that is embedded into some kind of material. Again, if anybody has one, please, I'd love to talk to you. Um, I had a wonderful group of students this past summer, and what they did is they they 3D printed a flexible uh, piece of silicone and they put 18 monopolar electrodes and were measuring the noise and they had pretty good results. It's, it's far away from ever being something we're going to use, but it was a fun project to try to see what kinds of data we could pull from it. So those are some of our, our, our current areas that we're investigating. I just wanted to finish to talk about some of our partners that we work with. Um, I work with the New Brunswick Innovation Foundation and OT by Electronica several years ago, very kindly participated in a study, um, and that was the um, ergonomic study where we had the individuals pushing the platform track. I'm also funded through the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council for most of my discovery research, but they also have a wonderful program, which is an alliance program with international collaborators. And then I just wanted to finish by mentioning the MyTex Global Link program. Some of you may be aware of it, but it's a wonderful program that allows third year students to go to another country for a 12 week internship. MyTex um, is a, a very good host of this program because they provide a stipend for the student, they take care of the visas, they take care of their travel. Um, the last time I checked, France, Germany, the UK, Australia, Brazil um, are all part of the countries that are in this program. I do not believe that Italy was one of the countries, but I would suggest to my um, academic partners from Italy that this is something that you should look into because this was the crew that Dr. Chester and I shared this summer along with a couple of graduate students and they are some of the strongest students that you can get for an internship and the wonderful thing is that they take care of the logistics and the students that complete this internship can apply for a graduate scholarship to come back to do graduate studies. So I'll leave it there. In the middle of that photo is my uh, co-director, Dr. Victoria Chester, and we have one project engineer. We probably need another three, um, but Nayeli Marcial Munoz is our project engineer. So that's a little bit about us. Uh, thank you, Usha. Thank you, really. Um, we selected some people and we like that people share the, the knowledge, the, um, the experience. So we'll see several uh, presentations with really different approach, really different um, techniques showed or um, uh, results or whatever. So uh, we, we made the selection. We hope you enjoyed, but I'm sure you will. Um, now it's time for Roger and Oka from Boulder, Colorado, uh, talking about the KISS effect, if I'm not wrong. Uh, buongiorno. Um, perhaps you're wondering what the KISS principle is. Well, I will enlighten you. Andrea, are you listening? I want you to listen, please. So I received this message from Andrea on May the 11th, 2023, 
and this is what he said to me. He said, about the talk, it will be only 15 minutes and it has the aims different from a typical scientific presentation. Will we really appreciate videos and pics that shows your activity, your protocol, your university as a sort of advertisement for your work. So I interpreted that in terms of the KISS principle, which is keep it simple, stupid. Uh, watch. So here's the pegboard test being performed by a young person and an older person, and for about 15 years, we have been trying to explain the difference in time to complete this task. So as you look at these two videos, you can see clearly that the older person appears to be a bit more deliberate, takes longer to do the test, and we're curious to know uh, how can we explain this difference in pegboard performance. So I'll leave you to look at this video, and you can look, uh, focus on what the hands are doing and what can you see that the hands are doing that might explain uh, differences in pegboard times. So the general conclusion that you might draw from these two videos, and, which, and much of which is in the literature, is that old, the performance of older adults is definitely um, worse than that of younger adults. And you see many papers that talk about declines in function with advancing age. Uh, but one of the points I want to make to you today is that not all older people are the same. Okay, so here's a video. This is a 68-year-old woman, and if you look at her hands, she's clearly superior to the other two individuals. And it turns out that the time it took her to complete this test was 36 seconds, which is the fastest we have ever recorded in the lab, and we've recorded hundreds of people doing these tests. So she had very fine uh, motor skills. And so we uh, just, I'm going to tell you the results of a study that we've just completed, and, and this person was a participant in the study, and we recruited uh, a range of older adults, uh, ranging in age from 80 up to, excuse me, 60 to 80. We had them do the test, and we recorded the times, and then we did a um, cluster analysis using different, several different techniques, and each, and each procedure identified two groups of individuals, one group of older adults uh, who were faster than another group. So we had a slow group and an old group. The important point here is that, that the grouping was not related to chronological age. So I think it's a big mistake when people study aging and classify uh, individuals, participants, based on chronological age. The more appropriate approach is to take some performance criterion and cluster them on that performance. So here we the performance criterion was pegboard time. So we took these individuals uh, and we had them perform a practice intervention. They simply come into the lab on six occasions and do uh, 25 trials. Over, uh, and this is the, these are the data that we had. So in the top, and uh, we have the um, people in the slow group in red and those in the fast group in blue. And what you see in the top graph is the time, the first performance of the pegboard time, and on the right is the second performance after the practice intervention. And below is the times at each of the practice interventions. So there were six practice sessions, and you can see, clearly see that there's quite a drop there at the beginning for both groups of individuals. And if we group the data, this shows the absolute change in pegboard time uh, for these two groups of individuals. And the, in absolute time, the greatest change was for the, um, uh, the slow group. But if we look more carefully at what's happening across the practice intervention, again, the red is the slow and the uh, blue is the fast, and we um, do a statistical analysis of the change in the average group pegboard time, we could, we could fit these changes with uh, two functions, uh, initial one that was a steep slope and then a more gradual slope. And we interpreted these changes indicating the first part representing um, the acquisition of a novel motor skill. So a pegboard task is definitely a novel task. 
And what you see is a rapid decline in the pegboard time for both groups of individuals while they are learning this novel skill. And then subsequent practice sessions was what uh, people call the consolidation phase. So interestingly, for both groups of individuals, uh, the break point between these two phases was after 12 trials of the pegboard test. So a single trial is definitely not sufficient to class characterize uh, dexterity. And another thing that we did is we had the subjects perform the pegboard test by putting it on a force transducer and measuring the downward forces applied to the pegboard. And you can see here, here's the downward deflection as they're pushing the peg into the board. Phase number one is when they're picking the, pe the peg out of the well. Phase number three is when they are inserting the peg into the board. So the other two phases are phase two is transporting the peg from the well to the hole. And phase uh, four is moving the hand back to the well. So if we take these three, four phases, which we call me peg manipulation phases, and we look at how these times differ across individuals, here are some data for three groups of individuals, young, middle-aged, and old, and you can see the insertion phase is the longest for all th uh, three groups of individuals. And if we use these data, these times, pegboard times, to predict pegboard times, we get some strong associations. So for middle-aged individuals, uh, you can explain 78% of the variability in the observed time based on the times of two of these phases, the insertion phase and the return phase. And for older adults, the correlation was not quite as strong, uh, R squared of 0.49, but the predictive variables differed. So it was the selection phase and the transport phase. So back to the uh, practice intervention, here we have the fast group on the left, and the, uh, this right, and the slow group on the on the right. And here are the phases before and after. So they became faster with the pegboard time, but for the fast adults, it was because they increased or decreased the time for the transport phase, moving the peg from the well to the hole. In contrast, for the older, uh, for the slower group, uh, it was the same phase, but the biggest difference was in the insertion phase. It's how long it took them to place the peg into the hole. So we interpret the uh, significant difference in for the fast participants as suggesting there's been some change in trajectory variability, the capacity of the individuals to uh, produce a smooth and accurate trajectory Whereas for the um, other group of individuals, the insertion phase being the most significant, we think this has to do with precision with which they can insert the peg into the hole. So we're subsequently beginning studies to try to understand, can we explain these differences in terms of motor unit activity? So our, our we're guided in this by some uh, previous uh, studies that we did and uh, that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, so first of all, in terms of trajectory variability, uh, we did a study in which we put fine wire electrodes into the first dorsal interosseous muscle and to its antagonist, second palmar interosseous, and we recorded EMG signals while subjects did a um, rapid target-directed action. And this action was a... Um, they had to reach this target value here in 150 milliseconds, and the target force was approximately 9 newtons, um, and they had repeat trials. So this is a set of 25 trials by a young person, and here is a set of 25 trials by an older person. And the point here is that the trajectory is much more variable. They're less uh, precise in repeat performances, and when we looked at the EMG recordings, these are the fine wire recordings from the uh, agonist muscle and the antagonist, and here is the task. And what we're, in, we're going to do is we're interested in motor unit activity in this first 150 milliseconds to see does this change differently in these two groups of participants. And then the other aspect is about the precision of the uh, insertion phase. And this is guided by some work that we did on force steadiness. So very briefly, I'm going to tell you about one of the studies in which 
the attempt to explain differences in pegboard times based on strength, force steadiness during two different tasks, and a reaction time tasks. So the force steadiness tasks were single actions, pushing the index finger sideways, pinch grip here, and wrist extension. And then the subject had to do two of these tasks at the same time. So index finger abduction, wrist extension, or wrist extension, and the pinch grip. And very interestingly, what we find is that the coefficient of variation for force, so the measurement of force steadiness, the force fluctuations were greater when they did the double action task. So let me just say this another way. The muscles are producing exactly the same force, exactly the same force in single and double. But the force fluctuations are more pronounced when they're doing the two tasks at the same time. This must mean because that the uh, motor neurons are receiving different uh, types of, of synaptic input during the two tasks. So if we try to uh, go back to our steadiness task, here's a single action pinch. Subject had to apply a force up to 10 newtons and hold it steady. And then this is the same force, same muscle, same target force, but now this is the double action and again was to get up to the target force as quickly as possible and hold it, to hold it steady. We measured the time to match the target force and the amplitude of the force fluctuations and we found that in young adults that we could explain 70% of the variability in the pegboard times based on those two outcome variables. And so the outcome variable uh, was the time to match the trajectory during the double action pinch. And then the other one was force steadiness during wrist extension. So to summarize the main points I've tried to make today, the time to complete the groove pegboard test is unrelated to chronological age in older adults. And pegboard times decrease with practice for all older adults. And older adults require 12 practice trials to acquire the novel motor skill. And the adaptations and peg manipulation capabilities differed for older adults who had either slow or fast pegboard times. In case I didn't um, uh, mention already, Andrea, I'm from the uh, University of Colorado Boulder. And if you didn't know, we have 300 days of sunshine in the year in Boulder, and we're at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. And uh, next time I will write shorter mail, maybe it's better. <laughs> anyway, um, I would like to use this time. We are in advance, but better like that. So the, the, the day will be less heavy. Um, I would like to introduce my cooperator about the software, soft, the software designer. Already Enrico described them uh, before, but now they will show the new software and uh, finger crossed for, for me, better for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I'm Simone and together with Fabio we want to show you a very, very quick look at the new software. Uh, we decided to develop a brand new software to get closer to some of our customer needs with new feature implementation to overcome some restrictions of the old technology and for two other main reasons. We know that uh, many of you use OTBLab mostly for uh, the acquisition and then move the data into Python, MATLAB or another environment and some others find software a bit confusing and this is um, this is true, especially for uh, new customers. So keeping this in mind, we want the new one to be uh, faster, uh, smoother, easier, and in general, we wanted to create um, a better user experience. Um, everything you're gonna see is a sort of alpha state. We are not 100% uh, sure we remain the same so once we have collected some feedbacks, but um, anyway, um, let me just... Oh no, trackpad is not so ideal, but um, simple loading screen. Okay, uh, this is the main menu. Uh, we split it in a half. On the left side, you can find everything related to database management, subjects, study cases, 
As you can see, it's still in progress and will not be available in the very first release, but we'd like to let the user create its own workspace and keep track of its work. On the right side, instead, we have the real-time, the offline, and the setup. Um, before passing the microphone to Fabio, I want to show you uh, a bit about this last one. We moved from um, the three-view visualization into a 3D visualization of the devices. Uh, with drag and drop, you can just select an adapter and attach it into a connector slot. So with few, a couple of shortcuts cable, you will be able to create complex setup in very few seconds. In addition, we know that um, having just one setup at a time is not ideal, so we decided to let the user uh, create an entire list and everything is uh, already entered by the software itself. Um, okay, Fabio, I think uh, you can continue with the... Okay, uh, hi again. Uh, let's keep going with uh, this brief presentation. As Simone already introduced, uh, uh, these are the main parts of the software. What I'd like to show you is uh, the offline visualization. Here is where you can open the, a file, plot the data, and obviously also uh, process the data. Uh, as you can see, maybe already from the setup, uh, there are the two side menus that are uh, connected. So you just click, for example, in one of these buttons and another panel will be opened in the right side. We think that this maybe can improve the usability of a software in uh, just to avoid to click a lot of time or to open too many tabs. Uh, now we have prepared a file, file for OTB day, obviously. And uh, this is our current uh, current visualization. I don't want just to spend too much time in this part. I just want, for example, to run a processing. Um, for the users of OTB Labs, they remember there are different tab, different click to do it. Now it's quite simple. Uh, just click on the processing button. Uh, it can also be opened just to see, for example, what this button means. And then we, we split it in different tab. And now, for example, I just choose the composition. This is what we call Launcher. Um, it's, uh, it's a tool that uh, keeps open uh, in background. This allows you to run very frequently and uh, faster the decomposition algorithm, for example, with different set of parameters. Um, now, I just choose, for example, this track, because this is the only one that I selected in the main part, and click the Run button. Here, as you can see, this menu is quite uh, empty. This is just a first version. We just inserted some information here, but uh, we can for sure increase the number of information, uh, may make, uh, I don't know, maybe with your feedbacks or with uh, some uh, advices from you, we can think how to fill this part. And uh, uh, as I said, the launcher will be always uh, uh, there, and it, it can be used again when the algorithm will be uh, concluded. Here, let's, let's just uh, finish the, 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 compos the, the composition algorithm. Here is the new, uh, the new visualization. We split the results in different tab. For the users of the previous software, it's quite common, this, this visualization. Here are, for example, the motor units that we extracted. Here, the firing rate uh, source with the firing rate instance uh, highlighted in uh, red point. And finally, the discharge rate uh, of, of this motor unit. In the upper section, there are diff uh, all the list of motor units uh, that can be uh, accepted or refused. These are some shortcuts that allow you to accept all the motor units, refuse all of them, and so on. These are the buttons that allow you to uh, export the data from the, from the result tab, for example, to the main tab. And uh, this can be done with motor unit, firing rate, and sour, and source. That's it. More or less, this is just a, a short introduction of the software. There are a lot of features, uh, features that we want to show you and a lot of features that we have to implement. We have a lot of idea. And uh, we want your collaboration. Uh, if you want, uh, we are right there in uh, in the stand, uh, orange stand near the main uh, in the corner. Uh, we will be right there, me and Simone, to answer your question, to discuss with you about software, what you'd like to to see in the future of this platform, 
And uh, especially uh, for all the persons that are interested, uh, we can have your email, we can take your email, and we'll send you this alpha version uh, to all of you, to all the persons that are interested and that want to help us uh, in the development for the future. And the software is totally working with uh, uh, also the old devices. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, enjoy the OTB day. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, it was, was okay. Uh, okay, I would like to introduce uh, Michela Favaro, that is the Turin Deputy Mayor, for a short introduction. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm um, greeting you from uh, also on behalf of the Mayor of Turin, Stefano Russo. Um, it is very important uh, for Turing uh, to host uh, this kind of uh, events. Um, we, we are working very hard uh, to increase uh, the Turing International, uh, inter international uh, uh, and uh, uh, to, to be able uh, to, to host uh, uh, many people from all over the world, and especially uh, you represent important research institute and important university, and uh, this is really important uh, for our city. Uh, we, we, we really believe uh, in uh, research and development and uh, innovation uh, as uh, a, a goal to be achieved in the, in the future. And uh, we already have here important uh, university and uh, research institutes and many uh, companies. And especially, it's becoming more and more important, uh, the bioelectronics uh, uh, business. Uh, we all experienced uh, during the, the pandemic how it's important uh, um, to increase uh, the, the, the R&D in, uh, in regarding healthcare, uh, also to better uh, the quality of life of the patients. So uh, really, I, I, I really want to thank uh, Mr. Bottini and uh, to, to having organized this, uh, this important uh, event. And I do hope that you will, will enjoy your staying in, uh, in Turin. Uh, you will uh, enjoy uh, the, the beauty of our city, the important cultural heritage, and maybe come again to, to visit uh, our, uh, our city. So I wish you a fruitful discussion and exchanging during these days. Thank you. I would like to invite to talk Natalie Kersting from Albert Ludwig University at Fribourg. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you, Andrea, for inviting me. I think he doesn't say my full name because he's a little bit scared of it. Natalie Braha Skerting. <laughs> it's very difficult to say, but I'm really happy to be here. I think Andrea has been trying to get me to come for a while. Uh, I've never been able to, and I'm so happy to be here now, and I love the atmosphere. I mean, just talking to everybody and finding out what everybody's doing and exchanging ideas. And I have to say, I'm relatively new to this. I kind of fell into this area through Dario Farina, who I just saw up there. Hi. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to follow, where's Roger? Uh, Roger, who just spoke before. Hand up. Ah, up there. Roger, thank you. I'm going to follow the KISS principle and first introduce myself. So I'm going to do that now. Uh, where am I from? So this is, I moved very recently to Freiburg University and uh, Freiburg is an amazing place. It's actually a city that is on the cornerstone of three countries, France, Switzerland and Germany. Um, and uh, this here if you can see that, it's where my office is. And this here are some of our very well-trained athletes who have to perform their dance routine 
as part of their exam. So it's, it's a pretty nice place it's in the Black Forest. Mm, this is the view from my office. So I've got a very nice office too, if any of you ever want to come and visit. And um, this is a, a little river that is close to my office. It's where the students during the summertime cool their beer, which is, of course, also very nice. Uh, but of course, we also have very nice places to have beer very close by. So this is around the corner from where I am. And this is part of my group. And we've just finished a big semester. So we celebrate at the end of the semester. Now, having said that, um, I think one of the things that I really like about this meeting is that people are getting together from different areas and they're discussing things. And, uh, you know, they're trying to solve, find solutions. And this is also something that we try and do at the University of Freiburg. So, for example, in this case here, we have a lot of different types of students from medicine, physics, psychology, etc., playing instruments, coming together and helping our dancers do their performances. And then this mix, they discuss, they talk, they start collaborating. It's actually really, really nice to, uh, to see. And this is one of the halls uh, of my institute. This is then what is uh, the result of their working together. And they did this performance in the uh, big theater in Freiburg, so in the city of Freiburg. And what's even nicer um, is that, you know, they also involve some of the children, and these here actually were refugee, uh, refugee children, um, and these are our very well-educated dancers. I mean, they're highly trained. Um, but then going back to, you know, the research that I do, I do do research on these highly trained athletes, but I actually have been doing research on patient groups for quite some time. And this is one of the patient groups that I work with. This is a stroke patient. I'm going to play you a video um, because I come from the area of brain computer interfaces. But you can also see this very nice box here, which is a uh -huh, uh -huh. Monica box. So this was in collaboration with Dario Farina and one of his students. We not only looked at how we can implement a novel type of training, which was how the brain can control an external device to provide input to the muscle. So you're basically combining brain signals with peripheral input to induce plasticity to improve function of these kind of patients. Huh? So it's basically motor learning, but artificially induced, except the patient is driving his own rehabilitation process by using brain signals to induce muscle activation. And... Um, this kind of brain-computer interface, I have just found out, is the way that it's going to go from now on. I mean, there was a paper just recently published. But together with Dario and one of his students, we started to look into what actually happens at the level of the motor unit. Um, and initially, the only graph I'm going to show you of this work now is this one here, where you have the coefficient of variation of the force along the y-axis and the age in years. So this was actually showing how age and the coefficient of variation in the force, how that increased together, and I guess this is something similar to what Roger was showing before. But this is in healthy individuals. But we have all the data from the stroke patients that we have yet to look into to see how that actually develops, and then how that has an effect on the alterations in the motor unit um, firing and the synchronization. The other patients I work with, I'm just going to show you a video of this now, are patients at home. So this is a patient, uh, he's wearing a cap and he's wearing this nice glove. It's an ALS patient, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. I guess you've heard of this. This is very debilitating, this disease. People basically lose all the possibility of control over their units because, you know, the motor neurons basically die. So what we try and do is we try and use brain signals Oops, now this, oh, yeah, we're trying to use brain signals. You can see that from the cap here in order to drive some gloves to help them grip better very early on in the disease to maybe later on when all the motor neurons are dead to then just use the brain signal. So really it's an idea of trying to combine motor unit activation or muscle activation patterns and trying to relate this back to brain activation patterns um, so that when all the muscle activation is gone, maybe you can just use the brain signals and make good predictions about what the patient wants to do.
This is really tough work. I went to all these patients' homes myself. I tested about 36 within one year, and some of them, of course, during the time that I was doing the investigation already died. So this is a little bit uh, sad. Um, then um, just another picture, not just another video. This is another ALS patient you can see were working in their own home as well. They often have a respirator, a res respirator, artificial ventilation. So you can imagine what this does to any kind of signals, no matter whether it's brain or whether it's actually motor units um, or muscle activity, the signals are going to be uh, exposed to a lot of noise in the home. And we try and find ways in order to, you know, not make that happen. Okay. But now uh, let's have a look at, you know, the actual talk, the Paralympians, because one thing that I didn't show you is the Paralympic Center is right next door to my office. This is where the the Paralympians train. This is where all the coaches are, and I do big collaborations with them. So first of all, let's have a look at this guy. This guy is on a sledge, and um, you can see that he's a monoskier, and he's on this large treadmill, which is part of my lab. And this guy here is quite young. He's only 17 years of age. And you know, let me just quickly tell you his story, because at the age of 14, he was in the playground with all his mates. And, you know, as, you know, they can be, they were playing around, and they were hitting each other on the back and they were having a fantastic time. Well, little did he know that he would wake up the next morning with an infarct within his spinal cord. So basically he had had bleeding within the spinal cord as a result of the whacking on the back and he became paralyzed from the waist down. But he didn't give up. Uh, he continues to do a sport and he's actually quite an amazing kid. And uh, we're trying to help him to improve his posture within the sledge. Um, then the next video I want to show you is of another guy, another tragic accident. Uh, but I just want to, I want you to sh uh, see the video and just think a little bit about what is wrong with him. Because he's a Paralympian in an indoor ski hall. We were in there minus six degrees for nine hours testing, uh, my husband and I, uh, together with some of our students. But this guy, when you look at him, you can't really see much wrong with him, right? But in fact, he is amputated through the knee on his right side but he's skiing incredibly well, right? So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to, uh, we've just panned in a big round to try and improve the way that he is controlling his ski, uh, that he's controlling his prosthetic device. So these are the kind of patients I work with, but then also this kind of thing I work with. This is a high level athlete, a sprinter from Norway. Uh, and again, here we're using some kind of brain signals to try and improve the function. Uh, but I won't go into this instead, because I'm going to run out of time and I often talk too much. Um, I want to tell you about the study that we're doing right now. Um, it was kind of cool. We are approached by the coaches all the time saying, hey, Natalie, look, we have this problem. Can you maybe help us solve this? And um, one of the problems was with the Paralympians who did biathlon shooting. Now, for those of you who don't know, and I know that Monica somewhere in here, if she raises her hand, she's, ah, <laughs> she has two, am I allowed to say it? Ah, <laughs> her two daughters actually competed at very high level in biathlon. So we had a nice talk about this last night, right? So this is a, an example, and I hope this video will play now, of a biathlete, and you can see they come in, um, you know, often much faster than what, what you just saw, and then they have to take the gun, they have to shoot five targets. Now, the disciplines uh, alter a little bit, but the problem that the coaches came to us with, with the, tri uh, with the um, Paralympians is during this shooting, the first number of shots seemed to go quite well, but the last few shots went very badly, plus they seem to not have such good control over the gun. I mean, you have to meet a target and shoot that target. So they were asking, can we maybe investigate what's going on? on and um there are a couple of studies in biomechanics on this but not sufficient ones so we thought okay well let's take a first look and see whether you know because when you when you look at this um the posture and i don't know whether this uh, this will not play again but if you have a look at the posture of a biathlete as they're standing there holding the gun they have to have good control of their upper body but also good control over their legs after they've just been skiing for quite a bit so the first question that we asked was well maybe we need to look a little bit at the synchronization between upper limb muscles lower limb muscles motor unit synchronization so the first thing was 
can we even measure motor units during a shooting component of a biathlete, uh, of a biathlon? So here's what we did, just very briefly. Uh, we did, of course, the normal MVCs. I'm going to show a photo of that in a moment for TDLS anterior, biceps brachii. Um, and then we chose the highest level as, as, you know, the maximum voluntary contraction. Then we did RAMs as is typically done a 10%, 30% of MVC. Um, they were holding, you know, they were following this ramp and holding it for about 60 seconds. So we had sufficient units. And then we did three shooting trials, uh, and they have five shots per trial. Uh, so in the lab, measuring the MVC, you can see very briefly, I mean, this is for the biceps muscle, you know, we just have a normal force transducer on there. This is Leonie Hirsch, an amazing student of mine. Um, this here is for tibialis anterior. You can see the force transducer here, so we're just pulling up to try and do the maximum force. So just very standard way of measuring the maximum. Um, then target shooting. So what you see here, we had to do it in the lab, of course. So we have our subject standing on a force platform that you can see here, shooting out into the room here. And you'll see in there, I mean, this is what the subject kind of looks like with all the matrix electrodes on both TAs and both biceps muscles on here holding the gun. And um, this is another view. So from this position, you can see into this darkened room, right? And this is where you have... Well, this is a little bit small, but you have these five targets that they have to meet. So target one, two, three, four, five that they have to shoot. It will light up. It will give them feedback whether they hit it or they did not hit it. Um, and uh, this is the gun uh, that they use. So this is not the real one. I think Monica's told us a little bit about the real ones and how heavy they are. This is this is a training one that they use. It's out of wood. It's a laser gun, more or less. So it doesn't really shoot anything out. Um, and we equipped it, uh, one with a force sensor on the trigger. Yeah, so we could see how much of a force was being applied to that. Uh, and we also equipped with an, an, with an accelerometer. You can kind of see that fixated here so that we could see how the gun was actually oops, moving around. Um, so we used that for the synchronization of the movements with a recorded EMG, right, from the matrix electrodes. So just very briefly, um, what are the preliminary results? Well, this is one of them. And this is something that I guess, um, you know, the experts in this room uh, should give us some advice about because we have a relatively short duration of the entire five shots. That is the entire five shots. Uh, even in our not so good athletes, we have about 30 seconds as the maximum. And that's not a lot of time to follow units, right? That's a big problem that we have. So we, we don't really know how to get around that. Um, and then, these are just two examples of units. So this is for the TA, this is for the biceps brachii. So the murder units can actually be identified, um, but the number of units during shooting is relatively low. So if you look at the TA for the shooting, we have one plus or minus two murder units. It's hardly anything. And I think Monica was saying yesterday that she tried to test you know, some EMG during the pool. I don't know, I can't remember what muscle you were looking at. The finger muscle, yeah. So we're looking at uh, biceps brachii, which is actually one of the supporting muscles, but even there, one plus or minus two units. For the 10% ramp, we have, of course, more so, same with the 20% ramp. For the biceps brachii, it's even worse. Now, we have two plus or one minus units, and then we have for the 10 and 20% ramp, we have very, very few units. So I don't know whether there's a lot of experienced people with biceps brachii. If there is, please come and talk to me. That would be nice, because we want to continue with this work. So just to give you a quick indication, these are samples. So this is biceps brachii, an example of one unit um, over the entire grid because we're using the 64-channel matrix electrode. And this here is for the TBLS anterior. One thing that we do seem to see is there seems to be more the appearance of the unit in more sites for the biceps brachii um, than for the TBLS anterior. I'm not so sure whether that's normal or not. I haven't talked to Dario about it yet. I need to do that. But just to give you an example of some of the recordings that we have uh, for today. So Really, the preliminary conclusions are it's possible to identify single motor units during shooting, TA, biceps, brachii, relatively few units identified during the shooting. We have a shooting duration which is relatively short, and the really good athletes are much shorter, even than 30 seconds. And uh, we need to ask ourselves, is with this kind of technology or this kind of methodology even further analysis possible, or should we go another way? So with that, 
I'm going to keep quiet and just thank these amazing people. So Ralf Rombach, he's the coach uh, of these athletes, and Walter Rapp, who's actually our biomechanist. Um, oops, I don't know why he... Ah, there you go. All the casting who's sitting over there, uh, who's helping a lot uh, with some advice on the biomechanical side. Of course, Dario, I thank all the time because we've worked so much together for so many years. So thank you. And then the funders, which are these two are the funders giving money to this. And then these people who have actually been... Um, instrumental in making this happen. Leonie Hirsch for one amazing student and then Margarita Castanova who is still to publish one paper from our uh, work together and of course the patients and the athletes. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Natalie. If you don't see me near the, 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 the place, it means that everything works and you are not in, in delay, okay? If you saw me around here, it's not good, yeah. Okay, so now we, I present the new website um, in brief, I hope. Just one second for the connection. Okay, two words, wait a second, Davide. Two words on the new logo, maybe Enrico presents in the video of Novecento Plus before release. It's really similar to the previous one, just we change the O and the T and some, some font, but the o, we like very much this kind of O and T that seems the button, uh, button on and off of, uh, of the devices. Okay, we can go to the new website. Okay, we change the previous version of course, to have a beautiful one and so on, but we introduce some new functionality. So on the website, I hope that you will find uh, all what you need. Uh, then we skip to the other page, Davide. This one is the, okay, we introduced, previously, many of, uh, of you, uh, when purchase uh, um, directly the accessories directly from the website, uh, receive a PayPal link where you can pay also using credit card, but even if you don't have a PayPal account. Now we change it totally and we introduce the possibility to pay directly with a credit card. This is a new, a new features. Then, Last things that I would like to underline, okay, then you can surf on the website and you can see the new uh, 3D uh, animation and so on, but this is another important part, that is the forum. In the forum, uh, you, we suggest you to ask things and to read uh, uh, how we solve the problem or the issue of other, other customers. So maybe in this way, the process to solve uh, problems uh, will be more fast. Uh, we hope to have a lot of comments and uh, we hope to be able to manage uh, as better as possible. In, the, we, in this year, we care a lot about uh, assistance and uh, I hope that you are happy about our assistance, uh, but we would like to improve that using this kind of new method. Uh, now I would like to show the OT, the slide regarding our numbers. I don't want to take about turnover and other things, but I would like to, to talk to you about these four, four pictures. Something, okay. Uh, the first on the left uh, is the number of our customer. We are really proud about that because it increased a lot and uh, we hope to that continues in this way. Uh, then the other one is really interesting because the number of papers with our devices that we are able to, to find uh, uh, on Google, and uh, interesting, the total number of papers is 784, and the number of journals in which OT Biotronica devices appear, 245. And also we are proud about the average impact factor that is free. Uh, other interesting things could be the web visit per year. Uh, not all the year uh, these uh, uh, graphics grows up, so we have to find a way to push uh, customer or potential customer to visit us, so we, are, we have to work on that. And uh, that one is something that is really important for us internally, maybe not interesting for you, but is the number of channels that we sell per year. This one, the number is really low, but uh, we have been stopped from, from the semiconductor shortage, so even if we receive a lot of order, we have many months in the first part of the year that we are not able to deliver devices. Now I can assure to everyone that we are 
in the run and uh, the components are available and so for the end of the year for sure this number will grow up. So I thank you all and I will introduce the next participants. Uh, Christoph is from uh, ATH, ETH uh, from Zurich and um, they are working on temporary tattoo for detecting EMG. So I leave the floor to Christoph and uh, and then, well, he will explain better than me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrico. Thank you, Andrea, for having us. So um, maybe this is a good transition from uh, Dan's uh, talk, because uh, I'm going to talk about a dry interface today. Uh, we are um, a group of researchers, um, particularly from Santana, and uh, me, myself, uh, I am a postdoctoral researcher with Luca Benini in, uh, in Zurich. And uh, there's also Laura Ferrari here. Uh, she will be back at the booth later on. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about temporary tattoos. But what are temporary tattoos? So maybe uh, the ones uh, under you that uh, have kids maybe know. Uh, because tattoos usually come uh, in this kind of uh, shape, uh, like a dinosaur or uh, any kind of animal and uh, you apply it on the skin. And uh, how do we get the functionality in that kind of platform? Well, uh, we need some deposition methods, and uh, we are using uh, basically uh, two methods. It's uh, inkjet or screen printing. Uh, the core difference uh, in between both uh, that uh, screen printing is uh, you can just uh, print much more volume in less time. Um, so this is our preferred uh, target uh, method. And what is the key characteristic of it to make it a dry interface for uh, EMG uh, data collection? Well, it's uh, basically the adhesion on the skin. So imagine uh, if you have like a carton board and you have your wrinkles on the finger, this carbon board will not conform to these wrinkles. So what is the strategy uh, to make this a dry interface? That is the reduction of the, of the thickness of the layers. This is also the big challenge because you need to find a suitable substrate that is thin enough and you need to fab fabricate and find a deposition method where you can uh, deposit very fine layers onto top of this substrate. So, uh, that's, that's the whole magic around it. So in the end, what you can see here, this is like a replica of uh, the wrinkles of the skin. And you will see that the tattoo basically is really conforming uh, to, uh, to the skin. Um, and what, what can we use that for? In the end, for many things. So Francesco's lab uh, is, has, this, has applied this technology to basically all EXG uh, modalities. Uh, my focus is more on the muscle side. So why muscles? Because uh, in 2018, I was or I wanted to investigate triathletes, uh, really fast running, and I noticed, okay, these biomechanical labs, they have so many sensors and uh, uh, wet interfaces, and I have a lot of movement artifacts. So my or one answer to that, or my answer to that was in the end today, is this uh, 18 uh, electrode, uh, sorry, 18 uh, electrode uh, temporary tattoo interface, where you can see here down, it's the application on, on the biceps, and we managed to connect it to the ITO, uh, OT bioelectronic system, the Sesanta Quattro, uh, just recently. Um, finally, I want to show you some results. Uh, this uh, device is not only an EMG device, but uh, you can also collect ultrasound data with it. Uh, it, it has a, a very good ultrasound transparency, so we tested this on a phantom. Uh, you can see here two phantom images, uh, one with and one without a tattoo, and uh, from a visual perspective you can't see uh, hardly any difference. There is some uh, compri comprising uh, in the contrast to noise, right, but it's minimal. And on the on the right side, you can see uh, the EMG channels collected on the OTBio, and uh, we found a signal to noise ratio from from uh, uh, 24 dB and a mean frequency at 56 Hz. Lastly, I want to show you the application of this tattoo on the skin. 
how does this work? So in the end, we stick the tattoo on the skin, and then on top of the tattoo, we have a, a support uh, a support paper, which we wet, and then we can just peel off this support layer. Uh, doesn't play anymore, but we peel off this support layer, and voila, we have our dry interface. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. We will be in the back. Whatever you prefer. So, um, next presentation is uh, Monica Grassini from uh, Edmonton. And uh, focusing on uh, how to use high density EMG in several, uh, several kinds of disease. So, Monica, the floor is yours. The stage is yours. <laughs> Grazie. Thank you, Enrico, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, questa è la prima volta che presento in Italia. Sono molto felice, so thank you very much. Um, so going along with the same uh, request from Andrea, um, I'd like to tell you who I am, where I come from, and what I do. So this is the pointer. Is it point here? Which one? Okay, the advance, yeah. And where's the pointer? Oh, right there. There. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I'm from the University of Alberta in Edmonton. And it's quite a big university. It's about 60,000 students and staff. And it's located right south of a beautiful river. And this is the lab right there. But of course, this is a beautiful picture in the summertime. And for five months of the year, Edmonton sort of more looks like this with uh, a lot of snow. Where's the pointer? Ah, right there. But usually we have nice blue skies um, in the city. But with a, a name like uh, Gorasini, of course, I don't originally come from Edmonton, but rather my family comes from northern Italy. Uh, here in the northeastern part, so Pordenone and Udine. Um, so I'm Friulano, allora Mandi, Chamut. <laughs> and um, so that's why it's very, been very nice for me to come here uh, as, a, as an extra visit. So the question then, what do I do? So if you're going to just put it in a single sentence, so if I would have a, a, you know, a headstone over my research grave, I'd pretty much have to say that um, I pretty much overinterpret the firing rate profiles of motor units to make claims about the activation of motor neurons by intrinsic conductances. And the reason why I'm able to get away with that type of thing is because a really nice convenient property of the motor neurons in that, for the most part, the, um, the firing rate of single motor units closely follows the underlying membrane potential of the motor neuron. And that in itself is um, proportionally related to the extrinsic synaptic activation of the motor neuron. So if there's any firing rate profiles or firing behaviors of single motor units that you can't explain by the extrinsic synaptic activation of the motor neuron, we can then infer and attribute that to the activation of um, uh, uh, intrinsic conductances. And what I mean by um, intrinsic conductances are things that are activated within the motor neuron itself. So voltage activated ion channels, um, intracellular calcium activation of ion channels to then depolarize and affect the firing act and activation behavior of the motor neurons. And so we'd like to study the changes in this intrinsic activation of the motor neuron um, in several diseases um, during development to see how it um, really changes and drives the motor neuron and how it might contribute to producing spasticity, so some motor dysfunction, uh, motor weakness, and um, uh, problems with uh, motor control. So in order to kind of illustrate you know, these, these concepts here, here's some intracellular data from a cat motor neuron. Um, so we're recording from a, in, um, a motor neuron in the cat and we're giving a sinusoidal stretch to, uh, to the muscle. So we're providing a synaptic input from, from the 1A afferents to the motor neuron. And this is the response of the motor neuron. We're hypopolarizing the motor neuron, so we're blocking all spiking. 
and we're blocking the voltage activated conductances in the motor neuron. So what you're seeing here is just the depolarization of the motor neuron from the extrinsic synaptic activation. Now when we remove the hyperpolarization and we allow for the activation of these voltage dependent conductances and we apply the same synaptic input again, but we're still blocking the spikes, so we're blocking it with a sodium channel blocker. The response of the motor neuron to the same synaptic input is much bigger, so it's much more amplified. You see a more accelerated response, and you see that the motor neuron continues to be depolarized even though the synaptic input um, is reduced. And so that's the you know, ability of these intrinsic conductances to amplify and change the shape of the depolarization of the motor neuron. And now you can see its, its effect on the behavior of the motor neuron where we now allow the motor neuron to fire. And you can see that it closely follows the membrane potential of when, when the spikes were blocked. So you can see this sharp acceleration and continued firing when the synaptic input is removed. So in order to kind of quantify the contribution of these intrinsic conductances to the activation and firing behavior of the motor neurons, we can provide a triangular uh, input to the motor neuron. So we can then look at the input and measure the firing response of the motor neuron, and we can see the amount of input we need to activate the motor neuron and compare that to the amount of input that um, happens when the motor neuron turns off. So this basically is a measure of how much current do we need to remove to counteract the added depolarization produced from these intrinsic conductances. So of course, you know, this is a very controlled input with intracellular current injection into a, into a cat motor neuron. And in humans, we can't, of course, do that. But what we try to do is we get the human subject to make a very similar input profile, this triangular input profile, by contracting and um, uh, using their dorsiflexion force to target uh, to, a, to a, a red target here. And this is the force profile here. And what we can do is use the firing rates of the motor units, which is a reflection of the, the motor neuron activity, um, during this triangular contraction. And so we pick up the uh, motor unit activity, of course, using the high-density surface EMG um, by OT Bioelectronica. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Um, and, and so we're using this as our measure of this input. Because during this period of, of firing here, the motor neuron responds quite linearly to its input. So we have an estimation then of what our extrinsic synaptic activation is to our motor neuron. And then we can look here at another motor unit, or another motor neuron, and then compare when it's recruited versus when it stops firing. So the decrease in this frequency, similar to the decrease in the current, um, so how much you know, um, estimated input do we need to reduce in order to counteract the added depolarization produced by these intrinsic conductances? So one of the um, recent questions that we've been looking at in terms of how these intrinsic conductances might change is during development. So we know that uh, in animal models, as the motor neurons become bigger during the first three weeks of the development, so the dendrites, the, the, um, the, look, the um, spread of the dendrites increases dramatically as, as the spinal cord grows, um, and these persistent in and these persistent inward currents I mentioned, they're actually produced by low voltage activated calcium, sodium, and calcium activated sodium currents. So these are conductances that are very physiological. They're activated when the motor neurons start to fire, um, and so they and they produce you know quite profound influences here. So during development, as the um, the rat goes from uh, not being able to walk to uh, being able to walk, and just before uh, right around weaning time, you see that the amplitude of these PICs um, get bigger. So these are the fast motor neurons, and these are the slow motor neurons. And we wanted to see in human development, can we see a similar trajectory or a similar change in the amplitude of these intrinsic con um, conductances, which might affect motor behavior during development? So we started to look at um, participants from the ages of seven years and onwards here. So a little bit after the developmental stage in uh, animal equivalency, um, so 
during, before puberty, during puberty, and up to um, young adulthood. Using again this delta F technique to measure the amplitude of these persistent inward currents. And so we plot them here against age. And so this is work done by Ghazala Muhammad Alinejad, a master's student. And you can see there's a very nice developmental decrease in the amplitude of these persistent inward currents. And interestingly, the, um, the amount of force steadiness while these children are making these contractions nicely correlates to the amplitude of these, these PICs. So it may be that during development, um, uh, we can't control our motor neurons as well. And so the, the, that might contribute then to um, you know, the um, immature in development of corticospinal intrac inputs or inhibitory circuits within the spinal cord that results in um, these larger intrinsic, more self-sustained activations of the motor neurons that then um, comes down to adult levels as you go beyond uh, puberty. So what we'd like to do next is to compare these results to children that have uh, received neurotrauma. So uh, children, for example, who have received brain insult during development in utero that then go on to develop cerebral palsy. Um, children that have uh, received uh, spinal cord injury that Natalie just showed. Um, and to then use these values to see whether or not there are differences in how their motor neurons are being activated and whether or not that's contributing to some of the, the motor dysfunction. So if anyone works with people, uh, with children with cerebral palsy or children with neurological injuries, I'd love to then collaborate with you um, using some of these techniques that we use. So if you thought that, you know, trying to estimate calcium currents was bad enough, we went a little bit deeper lately to really look into the firing profiles of the motor units during what we think is a linear increase and then decrease in input to the motor neuron by measuring the different um, slopes of the firing rate profiles during a triangular contraction again. So again, you can see in the cat motor neuron, um, so this red motor neuron is a motor neuron that's firing without any persistent inward currents, so without any of these calcium and sodium currents. And you can see that it responds fairly linearly to this triangular input. But in green here, when you do have activation of these um, persistent in recurrence, you see at the onset a very fast acceleration in discharge rate. And we think that's due to the onset of these persistent in recurrence that boosts the, the firing rate and the recruitment of the motor neuron. Then the motor neuron gets into a more lower gain tertiary range um, after the PICs have been activated um, because of some shunting of, of the inputs. And so we call that a tertiary range. And so you can see similar types of features in the firing rates of the human motor units here. So this fast acceleration during, and so we think that that's due to the PIC onset. So it's firing a little bit faster than you would predict from the rate of increase of the synaptic input. And then this lower gain tertiary firing range here, which tells you essentially the input output gain of the uh, response of the motor neuron to, to the synaptic input. And interestingly, sometimes you see a decrease in firing rate, even though the input continues to increase. And we're calling this a tertiary sag, and you'll see it in the human motor units as well. And currently, we're looking to see whether or not these are a result of the activation of um, calcium-activated potassium currents, these SKL currents, that might um, start to hyperpolarize the motor neuron once a sufficient amount of uh, calcium enters into the cell. And to study these types of um, currents on the firing behavior of the motor neuron, you have to use some neuronal modeling that we're doing with Kelvin Jones because you can't block pharmacologically um, too specifically these types of uh, potassium currents in the animal models. And, um, and so we're, trying, we're doing some neuronal modeling and some human experimentation to, to look at um, these currents here. So interestingly, when we compare the... Um, the, for example, the slope, the slope of the secondary range here, which we think is due to these PIC onsets, again, we see a developmental decrease similar to that delta F um, that we measured before. Um, but yet the tertiary range pretty much stays constant and is established at about from about seven years of age. So we think that, you know, this, this slope here might also be a good indication of the amplitude of these PIC currents 
especially if the um, activation time of these currents are constant, then a much stronger, steeper slope would be indicative of a larger um, persistent inward current. And in fact, if you plot the delta F value for each person across the slope of this secondary uh, firing range, you see a nice correlation across many subjects. So this slope here could be a good proxy for understanding the, um, the intrinsic calcium activation of the motor neuron and um, how this might change under various conditions. So interestingly, the, the participants in red here that have very high delta Fs and very high secondary range slopes, these were teenagers and young adults who were on serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which increases the amount of serotonin within the spinal cord, which also facilitates the calcium and sodium persistent in recurrents that, that are activated. So they're activated by um, G-protein coupled pathways. So that was quite an, an interesting finding for us as well. Okay, so the next, um, as Natalie introduced, we also look at the activation and firing behavior of motor neurons, um, in motor neurons that are dying within ALS. And in this condition, you have both genetic um, causes of ALS and some sporadic causes where there's no known gene that's um, present um, within these patients that are producing the disease. But in all forms, it's characterized by a translocation of the TDP43 protein from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm, which is then thought to produce a cascade of events that eventually starts to kill the, the motor neuron. And so we started to look uh, with high density surface EMG, the motor unit firing behavior in these patients um, to see if, you know, if they're different, if, if something can predict that, you know, this motor neuron's gonna die, this one isn't, what stage of the disease are they, are they at? And when we look at the number of motor units that we can decompose from the TA muscle, with the high density surface EMG and compare that to the number of motor units that we count, um, this is with Calvin Jones, using the motor unit number estimation. So you stimulate the peripheral nerve gradually and, uh, and uh, just estimate the number of motor units based on the growth of the, um, the, the motor action potential. You can see a nice correlation between the two, um, but only for the males. And in females, um, doesn't seem it's not as good of a correlation, and you really can't record a lot of mo uh, a lot of motor units uh, in the females, as um, often happens with high density surface EMG, potentially because of the smaller muscles, more more um, subcutaneous tissue, and whatnot. And this work's being done with um, Alex Yakinen, uh, postdoc in the lab. But when you look at the firing behavior of the motor units and of the motor neurons in these ALS patients, what is quite striking, so this is during a, a maximum voluntary contraction. So before the contraction, you can see spontaneous unit activity, and this is when the, their contraction is finished, that the motor units continue to fire. Many of them continue to fire, but at very low and very stable rates, so less than 10 hertz. And if you look at models of ALS mice, um, so this is a G95 SOD1 mouse, and you do intracellular recordings, in these mice as well, you see a lot of spontaneous discharge that you can only stop when you hyperpolarize the motor neuron. So this work is being done by Claire Meehan, which tells you that this spontaneous unit firing likely is an intrinsic property, and not that you have low levels of synaptic input driving these units, but rather the motor, the motor neurons are just firing on their own accord. And the presence of these low frequency discharges occurs in both asymptomatic and symptomatic TA muscles. So muscles that aren't weak yet, they have normal muscle strength, so MRC scores of five, but you also see them in um, uh, weakened muscles as well. So this type of behavior may be a good biomarker of early disease uh, progression and potentially um, diagnosis as well. Um, now, what is the, you know, what's causing this low frequency stable firing? Well, we often see it after chronic spinal cord injury. So in a similar case where in ALS you do have um, death of the motor neurons in the brain down to the spinal cord, like spinal cord injury where you have a disruption of um, corticospinal inputs, and we see this very low frequency stable firing. So if you depolarize the motor neuron, 
the membrane potential will creep back up again and start a series of rhythmic discharge in the motor neuron here at about two hertz. And just blowing this up, we can see that following the spike during the AHP, there's activation of a persistent sodium current that then brings the motor neuron back up to firing threshold, generates a spike, and you get an AHP, and then it reactivates again, so you can get this regenerative activation of the motor neuron. So it, this tells you then that in ALS, there likely may be an increased activation of persistent sodium currents in this disorder, and it happens very early on, either potentially due to um, you know, disruption of the descending inputs or as a response of the, um, the dying of the motor neuron itself. And another thing that we've noticed in um, some of the patients is the appearance of these doublet discharges. So again, we're getting the patients to do a triangular contraction. And here's the discharge, the, uh, the single, dis um, single discharge times uh, of the units. But often you see these doublet discharges that are occurring about 200 hertz. And every time you have this high frequency discharge, you have a very longer interspike interval at around six hertz or so. And so some motor neuron neurons show it quite frequently. So here's the lower discharges here. So high frequency discharge followed by a low. Then you get some single discharges at the carry frequency of about you know, 15 hertz or so. Um, here's got, this one has much more. And so we, when we initially looked at this data and saw these profiles, we really only saw this, these low frequency discharge points. But then when we went back and looked at the, um, the pulse amplitudes, we could see that there was um, these very lower frequency, uh, lower amplitude pulses every time after, a, every time there was a long interval, there was always these lower um, pulse amplitudes. So we know that from, again, animal studies, that these doublet discharges are produced by the activation of a spike coming from a delayed depolarization. So here you can have a spike, and then you've got this extra depolarizing hump here, and in some cases, an action potential can arise from this delayed depolarization. And like the you know, extra long interspike intervals after the doublets that we see, um, there's a long interspike interval as well after a doublet, and that's a result of a prolonged after hyperpolarization after each doublet. And now we know from uh, work done in the trigeminal nerve system, these delayed depolarizations are due to the activation of a high voltage activated calcium currents. Um, and interestingly, my collaborator, Claire Meehan in, in Denmark, she has a model of ALS where she can induce the translocation of this TDP43 protein from the nucleus to the cell body that then gives these mice the ALS phenotype. And she's noticed that this delayed depolarization is much larger in these um, mice that have uh, induced ALS and likely explains then the increased um, presence of, of doublets um, in the patients that we see. So um, it seems that as the disease progresses, you get more and more doublets happening. So up here, is just the number of uh, muscles and, and experiments that we do where we actually see the presence of these doublets. And in muscles that have uh, an MRC score less than five, so all of these here, you do see the, the doublets. Whereas in muscles that have normal strength of about five, you don't see the doublets. And the question then arises, well, you know, are the doublets in the excessive activation of these high threshold calcium currents is it a response to the um, ALS? Um, you know, is it um, you know is it a consequence of the motor neuron degenerating, or is it are these excessive currents contributing to motor neuron degeneration? But just from looking at the firing frequency response and the behavior of these motor units, um, you know, we can make some you know um, conclusions that uh, the sodium PICs and these high voltage activated calcium currents uh, do appear to be um, elevated in ALS. And hopefully this will then help guide um, you know, more of the animal experiments to look at these specific currents to be more relevant to the human condition. And we can also use these measures to determine whether or not a certain uh, drug treatment or physical treatment might be um, helping to save and uh, you know, stop the progression of the, of the motor neuron dying. So just to, to conclude then, um, 
just by looking at the firing rate profiles very carefully, um, you know, you can make some uh, conclusions about the, you know, the channel um, activation of, of the motor neurons. So, for example, looking at the self-sustained firing or the delta F to give you an idea of the amplitude of these PIC currents, how do they change during development, during injury. Um, these secondary range slopes might be actually a good proxy of this as well, so it's a little bit easier to do, but they also give you an indication of the, um, you know, the rate of onset of the, um, the PIC activation. These low frequency stable firing responses, um, you know, how strong is the regenerative activation of these sodium PICs that we often see after spinal cord injury and quite, uh, is, is quite there quite early on in uh, ALS and even in um, one participant who had a genetic form of ALS that didn't have the disease onset yet, but, but showed this type of behavior. Um, the doublets can be quite informative uh, concerning these high voltage activated calcium currents. And currently we're working on right now the um, what's called spike frequency adaptation. So as the motor neuron firing rates go down, even though your synaptic inputs are going up, is that a signature then of these uh, small conductance potassium uh, currents uh, within the motor neuron? And finally, how do these intrinsic conductances change after injury or neurodegenerative diseases to produce um, spasticity and, and the motor dysfunction? And so this is the, the crew. Um, Jennifer, longtime standing technician. Krista, Metz, Alex is doing the ALS work. And Vivak and Gazla doing the development work. Um, and Vivak was quite instrumental in getting a lot of the, um, the programs up and, and up and running. And here's a long list of the collaborators here. So of course, Francesco helps me out with the, uh, the decomposition. Um, doing some work on cerebral palsy with Kathy Quinlan in Rhode Island. Um, David Bennett and Calvin Jones. So uh, I do a lot of parallel experiments with Dave in uh, animal models to um, do the intracellular recordings in the motor neurons to, to really appreciate and understand the, uh, the mechanisms behind the, the firing behavior um, in, in the human motor units that we record from. Calvin, we're doing some neuronal modeling with, and um, he does the muni counts in the ALS patients. And Jonathan Norton was uh, in Saskatoon doing some work in cerebral palsy. And of course, Claire Meehan, who has um, several animal models of ALS that we work closely with to tie our, our data together. So, um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks again to Monica. I will invite Annette Vantal from uh, Newcastle University and from Azomis Company uh, that will present textile tissue, textile electrode. Great, so thank you very much. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm Annette Pantel from Newcastle University. I have, however, previously worked at Georgia Tech in Boris Proluxtri's group. So there is a little link to, to Monica's work in, in that I used to be a catty in. Oh. Yeah, I used to be a CAT EMG uh, researcher as well. Um, so what I want to do, I want to talk about, uh, just very briefly, I've been told it's only five minutes, only three, uh, three slides. I want to talk about a, a different line of research I'm working on, which is developing a device. So this is just a little band that you can slip on your arm, you can slip on your leg, and it links in with the, the Mwosi, um, 32, so this is the 32 uh, channel transmitter, um, to, to measure uh, EMG. So funding is uh, from the UKRI, so Healthy Aging a Challenge Award, as one of the winners, plus uh, there was a recent accelerator, which is bringing it ready for commercialization. And I'm working with a, a company, Conductive Transfers, who are based in Yorkshire. So what's the aim of this band? Well, the aim is, to, well, initially is to measure muscle health and just a few facts about muscle. So muscle is the largest organ in the body. On average, it's 38 kilos. And the key thing is it's an organ. So it's not just movement. It has many other functions as well. It deteriorates pretty early on. So from 30 years on, so most of you, your muscle's going downhill. Um, essential for health, for movement, obviously, interaction with the environment for living. And one of the key things, the one thing which is becoming, well, it being, being explored more and more are myokines. So over 600 different types. So these are special molecules which communicate with the nervous system, with the cardiovascular system, with the GIT, lymphatic, immune, and so on. So that is why muscle is essential for good health. Have you ever seen someone who's chronically in, ill but with really, really good muscle tone? No, you, you don't see that. 
So this is, uh, on the left, you can see uh, what young muscle looks like and what old muscle is like. Function will be different as well, but you have no idea what your muscle looks like. If that was your brain, if that was your liver, you'd want to know about it. So the big problem is there's currently no easy way of assessing muscle health or activity. Um, you know, we're researchers, we're all very familiar with it, but you talk to people outside, you talk to people in sports, you talk to people in clinics, they don't use EMG at all because it is a bit of a mess to use. So that's a slightly exaggerated picture, but palpating muscle, preparing skin, knowing where you're putting it, and then what you're going to do with it. So it's not easy. Um, just a couple of uh, uh, examples of uh, the cost of it and the numbers. So about 10% of people over 60 have sarcopenia, which is where there's quite dramatic loss of muscle mass and function, leading to falls, cost of falls, muscle weakness in the UK is over 2.5 billion pounds. So a little bit more in euros. Um, so it's a tremendous cost. If you look at pharma, you know, uh, by Magribab was a drug that was developed by Novartis. At one point, it was estimated to have potential sales worth 4 billion, but it failed its class 2B three trials. Why? Because there was no good muscle outcome measure. So it improved muscle mass, yes, but it didn't improve function. So it's pretty useless. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to develop a, a nice easy band. So the first iteration I developed a sock that had problems. So a band is far easier and it's going to be worn far more readily. So this is an example of the band. It can be used on the arm, it can be used on the leg, dynamic situations, um, isometric contractions. Uh, with the grant, we've been scoping the market, so we have had meetings with top flight, uh, flight, top flight sports clubs, uh, clinical researchers, various meetings with pharma companies, big tech, also with military, and that was interesting, so this was an elite um, force in the UK. And unfortunately, I was the only one who could attend that whole day, that was over a cataract, and involved me running with paratroopers, which um, is probably the most scary thing I've done for research. So what about the, the data? Well. Here you can see a cross-section, uh, an MRI section. That's actually uh, my leg showing the different muscles. It doesn't really tell you very much how big it is, but that's about it. You know, there's a bit of atrophy. Um, around it, you can see the, uh, the cuff that we've put around with the uh, 16 different channels, so 32 electrodes. Uh, we measured the, the force, so we used a, a biodex a dyn chair dynamometer, so we could measure the torque, we could also measure the EMG activity, and we found that there was very good approximation of EMG, so this is the magnitude, to the, the torque, or equivalent to, to force. Um, so it is a proxy to the force, which normally is very difficult to measure. We also looked at the signal-to-noise ratio, so we, we looked at the signal-to-noise ratio uh, of this band, comparing it to um, a fairly standard multi-array uh, band. We found the signal-to-noise ratio was very good, so it's about 30 decibels. It was a bit lower where we had the, the Movi, so that is one of the features we're working on. Um, so we've got quite a lot more to do, so this is the early stages. So we're looking at working with a German manufacturer to, to manufacture these professionally, so at the moment I'm unfortunately the only person who can sew in the team. Um, we're looking at uh, introducing 3D electrodes, at laminating it, um, making it a lot more robust depending on the, the purpose. Um, so thank you very much. Sorry, can I just add, we do have a stall over there and if anyone is interested, please do sign the form because I'm trying to sort of spin out and it's really hard, those of you who work in universities. So if we can get any expressions of interest, that would be great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Annette. Now I will introduce Dario. Some of you already know him, many more than some. All right, thank you, Andrea. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, as always. Uh, I think I've been here to all the editions of this day, so thanks to Enrico and Andrea for inviting me uh, continuously, and it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I had the task of filling uh, 40 minutes, I think, because lunch will be ready only at one. But uh, maybe we can have a longer break between the end of the sessions and lunch. So I just found out this morning that Andrea sent an email to all the speakers apart from me, so I didn't have the instructions on introducing myself. I don't have slides on, uh, on uh, where I work. Um, but I can tell you, I currently work in London uh, at Imperial College. Our main campus uh, is in a beautiful area of London, in South Kensington. That's the main engineering campus of uh, uh, Imperial College. 
and uh, we have a number of other campuses um, uh, around London. Um, our laboratories specifically are in the brand new campus in, uh, in White City, uh, which is in the, in the west part of London. Um, so I work uh, in London at the Department of Bioengineering, uh, uh, but uh, this city is particularly close to my art, it's my hometown. Uh, I've been trained here. Uh, together with Andrea, actually, in the laboratory of Professor Merletti for many years. And uh, we had to say that uh, a lot of us uh, owe a lot uh, uh, to Professor Merletti and uh, to his uh, inheritance that uh, is clear in uh, a number of the things that we are doing. Um, today, I, I saw the program when I, uh, when I was asked uh, by Andrea to prepare uh, a title, and I've seen that there were a lot of... Uh, uh, top physiologists talking, uh, Monica, Roger, Francois, and many others. So I didn't dare uh, put in too much about physiology because I'm an engineer. And I uh, preferred to talk uh, uh, more about technologies. And uh, what I will do is to discuss um, with you in the next 20 minutes or so on um, a few approaches that maybe in the future will further uh, expand the possibilities uh, of uh, non-invasive electromyography. We have seen in the last 20 years uh, uh, a lot of uh, advances. 20 years ago, it would have been uh, impossible that uh, a laboratory such as the one of Monica, very specialized in motor neurons, would even think at using non-invasive EMG. And uh, now, as you have seen, uh, even these top laboratories uh, in motor neuron physiology are using non-invasive EMG, and this has been the development of the past uh, 20 years. What I will try to do is to see what uh, we can do further. Hmm? And uh, I will not, uh, some of the slides will be a bit dense, but I will not go too much into, into the details. I will just want to discuss with you a bit of a sort of an open discussion on what are the open problems and what, uh, what we can do from the technological side in the, in the future. And of course, we have heard uh, from Dan, for example, Vetmore, uh, how, uh, how much uh, is the potential of uh, non-invasive approaches uh, for muscle recordings. So, uh, since we are in an event um, organized by a company, I have the obligation from my university to disclose to you that I have some uh, financial and research interest with some companies. Importantly, one of them is the company that is hosting us today. So that means that you have to take what I tell you today, or to, to believe it or not, uh, depending on, uh, uh, well, also considering, also considering this. Um, all right, so I will um, uh, talk about the three main topics uh, in uh, looking at the technologies for uh, uh, surface MG uh, of the future, or present and future. First, I will talk about EMG modeling uh, that was um, an area, biophysical modeling, I mean, was an area very active uh, some time ago, a bit less active uh, uh, in, the past, uh, in the past years. Then I will talk about processing and then I will talk about um, applications. And as, uh, as I said, it will be, it will be quite quick in each, of these, uh, in each of these topics. So let's start uh, with modeling. We all know how EMG is generated. Uh, we know perfectly the chain uh, from uh, the the formation of the neural signals uh, up to the biophysical of the volume conductor and uh, the generation of electric signals uh, on, um, on the skin. In, uh, in 99, uh, this is, uh, so modeling is particularly close to my art again, because in 99, when I joined uh, the laboratory of Professor Marletti, Professor Marletti asked me at the time, so this is 20, almost 25 years ago, to to provide the analytical equations to solve this problem. So this is a very simple uh, model of EMG. You have uh, the skin surface, then you have uh, a, a thickness, uh, which is the, the, the cutaneous layer, the skin. Then you have a fat layer, then you have muscle. And each of these layers have a different conductivity. And then you have muscle fibers uh, into uh, the muscle tissue, and you have recording electrodes. Mm -hmm. So at the time, uh, there were no uh, descriptions of multi-layers, and uh, I think this is my first paper. This is done with Alberto, who is here uh, somewhere. Uh, we published it uh, together, so that's, uh, uh, that was uh, very exciting for me. Uh, we presented this model, 
And then we've been working on this model for some years. And uh, after some years, uh, we found out that the applications of this model in understanding a bit better the generation of the signal uh, was important to interpret a number of techniques that at the time were used to process surface EMG. So at the time, up to, to this year and a bit later, uh, the main uh, approaches to surface EMG processing were literally very basic. They were spectral analysis and amplitude estimation. There was not much more. And there was a lot of inferences and a lot of, uh, a lot of discussions uh, and a lot of over-interpretation of these techniques. Mm -hmm. So by using this type of models uh, for some years, uh, then uh, as you can see, uh, there is Roberto, Merletti, Roger, Enoca, and I uh, wrote uh, a review paper somehow discussing uh, uh, how far we could go at the time uh, in interpreting surface EMG, and it was not very far. Uh, if you read this review paper, this review paper is quite negative in, in, uh, in relation to the technique. We were literally saying that the majority of the techniques uh, at the time used were uh, at best uh, speculating on potential physiological mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So we, so we continue working on modeling. Uh, this was a few years later. This was uh, another problem that uh, Professor Maletti asked me to, to study together with him. It was a bit more difficult. Uh, now you have a cylinder and you have again multiple layers. Uh, and when you are in a cylinder with multiple layers, if you just have equations, you have to start writing quite complex equations in a strange coordinate systems. But you can still solve this problem. So analytically, you can, um, you can uh, uh, determine what is the EMG in any point uh, on this volume conductor. And we use this model a lot, really a lot. Uh, and uh, some years later, as you can see, we had the sort of follow-up, uh, 10 years later, the follow-up of this review, now uh, updating uh, on what were the uses of EMG, also based uh, on, uh, on, this type, uh, on this type of model. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, just to, uh, to, to cut it short, uh, modeling in those years, uh, and, and, and even before, had been used substantially to interpret uh, surface EMG, to interpret the process of surface EMG, to understand the link with, uh, with physiology. After that, there has been a bit of a, a decrease interest in uh, surface EMG modeling. And uh, this is uh, until, in my opinion, recently. So this is work uh, very recent. This is from uh, Kostya and Sam, uh, who are in the company Neurodec and, and our own group in London. And this is um, a numerical model uh, this time, so now, you have seen the very simplified models that you have seen before, that we studied analytically. Now we can take uh, this uh, uh, MRI uh, scan of an arm, and we can solve the problem of recording EMG uh, on, the, uh, on the skin surface uh, in a very precise way, because we solve that uh, numerically. We solve that by dividing this uh, volume conductor in a number of small pieces, and for each piece, uh, finding a numerical solution. Mm -hmm. So this is a finite element model approach. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the novelty here was that uh, with some uh, mathematical uh, uh, approach, approaches, so matching a bit uh, an analytical approach with a numerical approach, uh, we were able to substantially fasten uh, the, uh, the, the numerical solutions. Eh? So classically, Finite element models in the past were taking days to obtain the solution for a single fiber or a few fibers. Now this model uh, take uh, minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's still, uh, it's not, uh, it's not a small amount of time if you then think that you have to generate uh, hundreds or thousands or, or tens of thousands of fibers. But still, this is uh, the fastest numerical model you can, uh, you can, uh, you can find in the literature. Now this becomes interesting because uh, you can really scan uh, the a limb uh, of a subject and you have a sort of a digital twin by uh, simulating the EMG as uh, if it was uh, recorded from that arm. And if you have exact parameters of this model, in principle, uh, you have an exact replica of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, of an individual. Mm -hmm. So now this is fast and we were quite happy about that, uh, but then we thought how to make it even faster. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's fast is important, but uh, it has really to be really fast to, 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 to be used in applications such as those that I will show you in uh, later on. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, our idea, actually this is Shian and Alex in London, uh, the, the, their idea, Shian is doing a PhD in London and Alex has finished a PhD just now, was to say, well, this model is very complex, it's a very complex numerical model, but still probably it can be learned by a very big neural network. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, uh, why don't we use this model, which is fast enough to provide enough, enough information to a neural network, we train a neural network, and then we have a neural network that basically generates action potentials uh, as if uh, it was the original numerical model. Mm -hmm. So I found this fascinating uh, when uh, we, we thought of this, because uh, this is also in relation to artificial intelligence, how far you can push the boundaries of artificial intelligence, right? So these are very complex biophysics. Can you have an artificial brain that learn exactly all those complex rules and provide uh, uh, that kind of representation in the synaptic weights of the artificial neurons? Mm -hmm. Well, it turned out that this can be done, and this can be done uh, in, a very, in a very precise way. Now here you can see a number of MOAPs uh, simulated in different conditions. It doesn't matter which are the conditions, but they are simulated from electrodes of this type, from MRI scans of uh, individuals. And uh, you, you probably cannot see it, but you have two traces. One is black and the other one is colored. One trace uh, is the exact numerical model with which the network has been trained, and the other trace is the neural network. And you have a, a, an error of around 2%. Mm -hmm. So now you have uh, a neural network uh, that learn a very complex model, not only, but this neural network can extrapolate. Uh, so one, uh, once uh, it learns uh, on a few conditions, uh, for example, on uh, subjects with different anatomy, it can interpolate uh, and create uh, the exact solution, for example, of uh, a person with uh, a thicker fat layer. Mm? So now you have a, a, a huge amount of solution that you can generate in a very, very fast way. For example, you can generate all the motor limitation potential in a mass uh, in, uh, in a fraction of a second, and you can generate uh, more than 200,000 conditions uh, in, uh, in a matter of hours. So this was unthinkable uh, until, uh, until some years ago. We'll see how to use that uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the following. But I want to say that uh, if I had to predict when I was given uh, 20 years ago by Professor Marletti that simple problem of the layers uh, and estimating the, and calculating actually analytically the DNG, if I, if I had to predict that it would have arrived to this level of uh, accuracy, I would, have, I would have never guessed that. Mm -hmm. So now we have models that are literally digital twins of individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can then go further. Uh, so this is this is all uh, work uh, still not uh, uh, published, part in preprint and part in not. But you will find it soon, uh, either in preprint and also as freely available software. You can go further and then put together the full chain of woman generation. Uh, so this is uh, work by Xian and uh, and uh, work by Arno, who is uh, here in the in the audience. Um, Arno has uh, finished uh, a PhD at Imperial as well, and is now a postdoctoral researcher in, uh, in our group. So you can then take um, uh, any musculoskeletal model, it can be open sim, you can create a movement, or you can even, you can even record an experimental movement. For open sim, you can estimate the muscle activation, then you can have a motor neuron model, and on this, uh, I suggest you to read the, the recent papers by Arno on uh, really going deep into extrapolating uh, full motor neuron activities from a smaller samples of motor neurons. So you can have uh, a realistic uh, neural activation, and then you can have the neural network generating motor limitation potential that I have uh, discussed before. This motor limitation potential with the neural network uh, change in shape uh, depending uh, on the change in length of the muscle. Uh, so they exactly follow how would be the biophysical generation, and then you have EMG, and then you have EMG signals. Mm -hmm. So now you have uh, a, a, a tool, uh, Xian has called it a neuromotion, that goes uh, from movement to the neural activation to the surface EMG. Mm -hmm. So we'll discuss a bit of application, but you can also see this uh, as a brilliant uh, didactic tool, for example. Mm -hmm. All this is working in, in a very fast way. Mm 
Mm? Because all these components are very, very, are very, very fast. As I said, I would have never guessed that we could arrive at something like this uh, when I started working on these, uh, on these problems. Mm? So what is one uh, problem, and this is a bit for the future actually, one uh, uh, application of these models, and then later we'll see some other applications. Well, uh, you can arrive uh, so close to having the digital twin of a person that you can even address the inverse model uh, problem. Huh? So for example, you could have uh, an observed motor orientation potential, and then you would have uh, a forward model, which is a neural network having the full information about the anatomy uh, of the subject, about the conductivity, and so on. And then you can have an optimizer, define the parameters of the model, uh, and minimize the error in order to exactly match the observed moves in, in a specific subject. So in principle, you can get uh, uh, any parameters of that motor unit, uh, any non-measurable parameters. Uh, so you could get the motor unit, the number of fibers, the depth, the orientation of the fibers, the conduction mode, and so on, which are all parameters of the model that, uh, that uh, minimize this distance. Mm. And here you can see just a, a very simple demonstration of this. If you go further, instead of an observed motor orientation potential, you can have uh, an observed row EMG, right? You can have the full observed row EMG. And you can have a model that is generating that EMG and is minimizing the error so that at the end, within this model, you have the full neural activation of the pool of motor units that are active with the full property of the motor units. Mm? So now, as I, as I say, that this is a bit uh, a look in the future. Eh? That was a bit my aim today. Eh? This is, we are far from fully solving that. But uh, Alex uh, is working uh, heavily on this, and he has uh, some interesting preliminary results showing that this is possible. So when is this possible? Well, this is possible, of course, when the model is invertible, right? And proving that that model is invertible is not that trivial, but uh, under some constraints you can do that. Okay, we'll talk a bit more about application of model by talking about uh, processing, which is uh, the, second, um, the second topic I would like to discuss. Again, in this kind of style, which is a bit uh, speculative for the future and uh, a bit of frontier research from the engineering point of view that is currently going on. So, of course, one of the problems uh, that, uh, problem that we will uh, solve in the future is uh, increasing progressively the number of motor units that we can decode. Mm -hmm. So, we can decode a number of motor units from surface recordings. In the future, the key aspect will be to decode more and more and to decode more and more in a, in a more and more accurate way. Mm -hmm. So now this is a simple approach to decode more motor units. This is again a node that you have uh, known, and this is uh, Simon, who has, um, who has been training in Francois's lab, and now he's uh, in London and uh, basically <coughs> working uh, uh, as a bridge between Francois's group and our group. So this is um, a, a study showing, uh, just published a few days ago, showing uh, which is the number of units that you can extract from surface decomposition where you increase the density of the electrodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally, I mean, uh, we were thinking that when you arrive at uh, eight to five millimeters uh, of intra distance, you have density enough because you, have re you are very close to reaching uh, the, the spatial uh, 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 minimal frequency or, uh, of, uh, of sampling. Mm -hmm. However, when you go down in density, you find out that you can go to very dense grids, even one millimeter distance, and this is a bit related to the tattoo electrodes also that we have seen before, because uh, by having miniaturized electrodes will be very interesting in the future. You can go to a very small distance, and you can see that the number of units that you can decode from the EMG increases substantially. Mm -hmm. So from a classic type of recordings where you are between 10 and 20 units, uh, if you have ultra uh, density MG recordings, uh, as we are starting to call it, uh, then you can get uh, uh, maybe three times that, uh, that sample. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with that? Well, with that, uh, we are, of course, in constrained laboratory conditions. We are starting to do things that are uh, really very, uh, really very interesting. This is again Simon, Simon and Arnaud. And this is work with uh, Francois and, and Roger and Oc as well. And uh, here what you can see is um, a very large number of units. 
in the full, basically the full force range, uh, the number of units that on average the tete per subject is about 100. Uh, and uh, this is done with some experimental tricks that uh, I will not discuss now. Uh, but this is accurate. Uh, we have looked at every possible uh, uh, <laughs> drawback in this. And here you see a very large number of units. And now with this large number of units, uh, for example, you can look at the acceleration of the firing rate. You see, this is the things that Monica has described uh, in, in a very beautiful way. Uh, and here you can see this acceleration fast, and this is the, the second part. Uh, you can quantify that, uh, and now the difference uh, is that uh, you can quantify that for the full population of motor units, almost the full population of motor units in the in that mass. Mm -hmm. So here, for example, you have the recruitment threshold, and here you have the acceleration of the firing rate. Uh, depending on the recruitment threshold, you see how differently the different units are behaving. Mm -hmm. And so this is, uh, as I say, work uh, on which we are discussing intensively with uh, Roger and Fuenza to, to try to put it, um, uh, to put it together. All right. How do you do this? How do you push uh, so much? You push so much uh, in a number of ways. I talk about uh, density, but you can also work with the actual decomposition methods. Mm -hmm. So the composition method, again, uh, you can uh, somehow put uh, into uh, into the game, uh, some more artificial intelligence, uh, more modern artificial intelligence methods. So you can have a neural network that estimate uh, motor unit firings, and you can have a certain method that train the neural network how to estimate those motor unit firing. Mm -hmm. So this has been done; has been published before this. But then, uh, normally, you you give experimental data to train the neural network. And this experimental data can be decomposed with the classic algorithms, for example, uh, the CKC algorithm or any other algorithm. Mm -hmm. But you remember that I talk about, uh, about modeling. Now you can say, well, if we have a digital twin that is uh, replicating EMG very similarly to the, to the EMG generated by real subjects, why don't we use uh, synthetic uh, signals to train a neural network that then will decompose experimental signals. And the advantage now is that uh, in synthetic signal you can put a lot of variation. You can put variation due to dynamic condition, you can put variation due to a number of, uh, of issues. Mm -hmm. And here is uh, just an example, it's very preliminary, it's reported in this paper, but it's a, a small appendix to that paper. They show the improvement in the composition accuracy in a complex task when you use simulated data to pre-train a neural network that then you use to decompose a real, a real signal. So now you see that uh, by having a digital twin, uh, you can also train uh, a system that learns uh, how to find uh, information from experimental data obtained from the individual to, the, to which the digital twin is, uh, is matched. All right, uh, and uh, for example, as I say, the one of the issues is uh, when you change the joint angle in, uh, in the composition, as we know, here you can see that these are simulations. You have a change in the shape of the Hessian potential that can be smaller or bigger, depends on the geometry, depends on a number of uh, conditions. And here you can see two cases. One is a classic decomposition, and one is a decomposition, again, very preliminary data. You, you, you don't see final results in this talk, uh, you, you, you will see the final results in the, in the future. You can see that when you train a network uh, that uh, learn from this condition, then you can recover the missing files that you were losing because the shape of the action potential was changing. <coughs> All right, let's go to the, to the last part uh, of this uh, talk, uh, looking a bit at uh, what we can do from the technological side now and in the future. So this is applications. Eh? So these are a number of, uh, a number of potential applications of um, surface EMG as interfacing. Eh? I think two years ago in this, uh, in this same event, I gave uh, a talk that was called the surface EMG for interfacing. At the time, it was not obvious that you can use it for interfacing uh, uh, actual technologies, for example, medical technologies, or, uh, or uh, consumer electronics technology, as uh, we have heard from uh, uh, Dan, for example. These are a number of applications that um, we have uh, done so far in our group. There are others, 
This has been, uh, in our group, uh, mainly spearheaded by Alessandro Del Vecchio, who is now a brilliant independent uh, uh, PI in Germany. Um, and these are examples of interfacing, for example, to drive prosthesis, uh, to control exoskeletons in spinal cord injury patients, uh, or even application of interfacing in, uh, in uh, uh, non-human uh, primate uh, uh, models, uh, or in conditions where it's very difficult to measure motor neuron. So there are a number of applications now in which uh, surface EMG is becoming uh, not only a Mayo interface, which is what we knew since decades, but it's becoming a neural interface, which means that you extract uh, the activity from the spinal cord, the output of the spinal cord, and you use that neural activity to control uh, external devices. Mm -hmm. So there are a number, um, a number of them. I will discuss uh, about uh, one of them and, and a vision uh, and a bit of a step forward with respect to the concept of spinal interface. Mm -hmm. So I will discuss uh, this application, which is the same as uh, done uh, as uh, presented. So the idea that in the future you can have wearable uh, unobstructed devices that allows you to go back to the spinal cord and to control, for example, a virtual uh, world or, or our smart devices. Mm. Actually, this uh, picture comes from a paper where Dan is a co-author, and uh, Irene Mendez, I didn't have her photo, but Irene is a PhD student in our, uh, in our lab, co-supervised also by, by Dan. Mm. So now, uh, what I will uh, discuss with you very briefly, and uh, it will be just five more minutes, I promise, is, um, the fact that we can, uh, now we know that uh, surface EMG can be used as a spinal interface. We have heard a lot on the code in motor neurons uh, and motor neuron activities from, uh, from EMG. Motor neurons are in the spinal cord, so we can see EMG as an interface to the last layer of the spinal circuits. By the way, the last layer of the spinal circuit is also the last layer of the nervous system. Uh, the nervous system uh, has its output layer, which is the ensemble of motor neurons. Uh, so for those of you who are engineers, uh, we have this huge neural network, which is uh, the central peripheral nervous system, and we are so privileged that we can exactly read the very last layer of that neural network. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are engineers, you know that when you look uh, at the output of a system, you can guess a lot about uh, the working principles. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we have heard uh, on uh, a lot of information we can extract at this level, but what about uh, at the brain level? Can we even uh, dare to think that uh, with a wearable interface of this type, we can not only read the spinal activity, but we can maybe even read the brain? Uh, can we do a brain interface? Mm -hmm. Well, this is um, interesting because uh, that depends uh, on the type of scene that the, from the brain go down to the motor nerves. Mm -hmm. So normally one would think, well, uh, eventually when uh, uh, signals from the motor cortex go down with the various pathways to the motor nerves, then you would have that uh, the output of the motor neuron is uh, very well matched with the bandwidth of the muscle. Huh? You know muscles are working in a very slow way. Uh, they are right to 10 Hz. Huh? So you would say, if you have to design a system like that, again, if you are an engineer, and you have to, des to design a, a, a controller of a motor, the muscle is the motor, the motor nerves are the controller, the output of your controller would be matched in terms of bandwidth with the working principle of the motor, right? Mm -hmm. Now, muscles are very slow. Uh, they are... Um, uh, uh, I have a bandwidth of around 10 Hz. And so you would say anything that comes uh, at the cortical level, as you know, we have very high frequency oscillation with respect to 10 Hz, uh, would be filtered out by the motor neuron because they control the mass. Well, it turns out that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. It turns out that uh, if you look uh, at um, the, the spectral content uh, of uh, a pool of motor neurons in a certain mass, uh, and this is a graph from uh, Sylvia, who has been... Uh, uh, wo working as a, as a colleague of mine for many, many years, and now she's also a brilliant uh, independent PI in uh, Sweden. So this is um, uh, a graph from Sylvia, a, a recent one, but uh, there are others uh, similar. You can see that the 
spectral content of the output of the motor neurons is very, 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 very large. Now, at 10 Hz, you have the information that is used to control the muscles. This other information is not directly controlling the muscle. Hmm? Not only, but that is very interesting because this information here, you would say, well, if it is information that comes from a supraspinal centers, it will be scrambled in, uh, in very complex ways because we have a lot of non-linearities in, uh, in the system. Well, you can demonstrate that actually if you have oscillation at low frequency or higher frequencies going down to population of motor neurons, if this is projected to a, a sufficiently large number of motor neurons, they are projected in an exact linear way. Mm? So motor neurons transmit linearly high and low frequencies. When you read the output, you have a, a quite high fidelity reading of what is arriving at the input of motor nerves. Mm? So what are these uh, frequencies? Are we reading something that comes uh, from uh, higher centers with respect to the spinal cord? Well, uh, we, we believe yes, uh, and uh, this is an experiment, again, a very recent experiment, not published yet. This is Blanca, PhD student again in, uh, in London, in the middle of her PhD, and she has finished this experiment that um, look at the preparation of a movement. So here you have a constant force, and then the subjects have a cue to get ready, and then they have a classic go-no-go -go paradigm, right? So they don't know which, which cue will arrive. If it is go, they have to uh, produce a ballistic contraction. If it is no go, they just have to continue without changing the force. Mm -hmm. So we knew, and this is very well known, that at the cortical level, at the cortical level in this type of paradigm, when you cancel the movement here, you have a huge beta activity. Huh? Beta is between 13 and 30 Hz at the cortical level. Mm -hmm. And now look what happens uh, at the motor neuron level. So this uh, is a time frequency representation of uh, motor neuron activity in the preparation, and this is uh, the no-go instruction. Huh? you have a huge increase in beta and gamma uh, bands of uh, the power in those, uh, in those frequencies. This is not related to movement. The, 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 the force is maintained constant. So you have no change in behavior. Huh? So that's, that's, that's not that trivial because you are reading motor neurons. Motor neurons are attached to muscles. They have the exact task of producing a specific input that produce force, yeah, you don't change force, but you have the reflection of something going on. And what is this something going on? Well, this is the coherence with respect to EEG. So when you measure with uh, uh, the activity of the motor cortex, and you have uh, a huge increase in the no-go. Huh? So this uh, high-level activity in beta and gamma two motor neurons actually comes from the motor cortex, and we can read that. Mm -hmm. And so, as I said, uh, I think uh, for the future, this is telling us uh, that uh, we are putting electrodes on muscles, uh, but we are actually reading the brain, not reading the brain uh, in a vague sense, uh, meaning uh, that obviously the brain produces movements, uh, and obviously movements are related to brain activity, but in a direct sense. We can read the cortical oscillations uh, in a very precise way coming from the brain. And you can go, and, and this is the last slide, I promise, you can go as, <laughs> as far as building a brain interface. Mm -hmm. So this is work by Mario. Mario um, has finished a PhD with us in London two years ago, and now he's an employee at Meta in New York, um, where he's um, doing um, fantastic things, uh, as uh, you have heard from Dan. During his PhD, uh, he did uh, this uh, experiment um, he took uh, a population of motor neurons decoded from a certain muscle and uh, he plotted the high frequency components of those motor neuron activity and the low frequency component. The low frequency component is what is related to force. The high frequency is above uh, 10 Hz, is not related to force. Mm? And uh, what he did was uh, to see if uh, by having uh, a visual feedback, so this is basically an operant conditioning paradigm, the subjects were able to move the cursor in, the full, uh, in this full two-dimensional space, which means if they were able to control the high frequencies independently, 
from the low, uh, from the low frequencies. And this, as you can see, is possible. And if you read uh, Mario's papers, uh, you will find out that uh, the modulation that you have for high frequencies imposing a motor neuron feedback uh, implies uh, that the cortical activity is also modulated. So if you record at the same time EEG, you don't tell the subject anything about EEG, you are modulating the EEG beta by uh, 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 decoding the beta at the motor neuron level. And so that's a classic brain-computer interface paradigm. Uh, the difference is you are doing that by placing a few electrodes on a muscle. Mm? And so that's, uh, that's quite... Uh, in my opinion, a, a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting direction. Also for the aspects of uh, augmentation on which, uh, on which uh, Dan was, uh, uh, was um, alluding at. But I have finished, so actually I have a photo myself, but it's just at the end. So that's, uh, uh, that's the new campus of Imperial in the west part of London. This triangular building uh, is uh, mainly bio, medical engineering. We are at the fourth floor. Uh, many of you have been uh, to visit us. Those who have not uh, are uh, really welcome to come. As Dan was uh, mentioning, uh, we have established uh, uh, an Imperial Meta wearable neural interface research center uh, recently, uh, on which there are uh, a number of positions available for the, for the, for the youngest uh, of you. And uh, with this, uh, well, I promised to arrive around one and I managed. I thank you very much for the attention.